Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for coming for this webinar. I hope it will be as interesting to you as I have found the talks of Sahili and Tarsh. Um, so, the title of the talk, you might wonder, you know, what does it mean? But even before I go there, I would like to say that as an ecologist, I was largely studying, you know, number of animals, what are they eating? You know, it's, it's, a, it's very quantitative usually, and it's only targeted at the animals. But when I was studying these animals, when they share space with humans, I realized that the human dimension is so, so much more important than the animal dimension. Because if the humans decide they don't want the animals there, it's very easy to not have wild animals in a landscape where people don't want them. And we have seen examples of that in many parts of the world. So uh, a lot of us biologists don't think of what these people are going to talk as science. Okay, now that's a deeper discussion that I don't want to go into. All I can say is that from my experience, it is okay if you're, uh, you know, if you're only doing quantitative work related to the animals, if you're studying the animals and natural systems, but when you're studying it in shared spaces, what these people are going to talk about becomes really, really important because then you start understanding how the people who share spaces with these animals view these animals. So I think it's a very powerful uh, knowledge system, which we ecologists should also acknowledge and partner with people like this so that you know, our understanding of shared spaces is much better. Um, so uh, Sahil will tell you why uh, tigers are brothers and uh, he will tell you why cats are aunties. But why I said elephants are like water is because long back when we went to Northern West Bengal, there was this uh, elephant which had come into this labor colony. And I just asked a man over there, like, you know, why did, why did the elephant, why do you think the elephant has come here? To which he said, elephants are like water, they go where they want to, you know, which I thought was such a lovely little statement to say and which I've used in the title over here. So before we go ahead, I would really like to thank Manish, who is from WCS India and who helped me with this, uh, arranging this uh, webinar because I can only access this for my phone, which makes it a bit difficult for me. And I would also like to thank, uh, uh, you know, uh, a person who just helped me on Twitter. I don't, I've never even met him, Mr. Arvind Joseph. And I'd really like to thank him because he helped Manish and me in arranging this uh, webinar. And a couple of points I would like to make is that this session is also live on YouTube. Okay. And I would uh, ask everybody if you have questions for these three speakers to give it to us at the end and say which of the person you're targeting your questions to. So now I'd like to introduce the okay, who uh, did a bachelor's in psychology from Ambedkar University in Delhi. And I read her thesis, uh, her bachelor's thesis, which was on bare human interactions in Tumkur area of Karnataka. And it was just simply fascinating. She went to do her master's in conservation biology from University of Kent and looked at relationships between humans and tigers in Sumatra. She's now an independent researcher, but the work she's going to present, she did it as part of a WCS project in Himachal. And she will be talking about human leopard relationships in Himachal Pradesh. So, Dee, please go ahead. Thanks, Vidya. Yeah. Uh, I'll just try to share the presentation. Just sorry, give me a minute. Uh, Manish, can you? Manish? So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, research that I did in Himachal Pradesh. So I went to Himachal, uh, this district called Hamirpur in Himachal in 2016 to volunteer for a ecological study. And uh, because of how people are there and because, uh, because the study was in a human dominated landscape, uh, we ended up speaking to a lot of people while going around the landscape trying to collect cats. And the way they were talking about leopards was so unique that it caught our attention. And uh, so I wanted to explore further into how they perceive the leopard. 
which is so different from how we had heard about the lab uh from say books or articles or as uh, from colleagues and so on so <clears throat> sorry are you for the next slide yeah so then this was what the landscape was like and uh, everyone in himachal was such that they would call you in to be shy talk to you and they would describe the incidents that they had uh, witnessed with leopards and uh, this was interesting to me also because i came from a psychology background and uh, within psychology when i was studying psychology i realized that most of it uh was related to human human interaction right like most of what we study within uh psychology is between humans and humans and there's not much about how humans relate to other beings like other animals or plants and so on and uh it would be so interesting to see how uh how we can expand our knowledge if we looked at other beings as well and how we relate to them how we perceive them and so on and then once i came into this field or got introduced to conservation uh started learning about how it can be so relevant for conservation as well and that the way people perceive the animals that they share the space with is so uh vital for the survival of that species in that landscape especially when humans and animals are living alongside each other so uh next slide so when it comes to trying to understand people's perceptions towards animals we have to look beyond objective truth so this was aristotle who spoke about there have been two kinds of truth truth with a capital t which uh, refer to objective truth and truth with a, a small letter t which is a subjective truth as experienced by uh, people and uh, to be able to understand perception you have to tap into what the subjective truth of people uh, are rather than what is out there as the leopard that you read about in a text so in this study what i'm trying to do is look at the subjective leopard rather than the objective so how do you how do you do that how do you how do you learn about subjective truth so the next slide the method that i employed was uh, ethnography so i stayed in that landscape for a uh, month and uh, lived the so there was one village around which i was uh, placed and uh, i tried to spend as much time as possible with the people in the landscape and uh, try to understand how they perceive the animals and how their lives are affected by the animal as well so it was an inductive methodology where uh, i didn't go in with any hypothesis but went there and explored and saw what came up from conversations with people there so i did semi structured interviews with a range of stakeholders including uh, villagers and uh uh migratory shepherds who come from higher up in himachal pradesh and uh, forest department officials the guards that uh, live in the vicinity and uh, even within the villages there was trees there was uh people who are called upon when uh leopards are notified as man eaters and then there were uh, village heads there were uh, women and men and older people so it was uh, combining the views of views and stories and accounts from different people and putting it together to make sense of how they as a community looked at this animal uh next slide <clears throat> so this was the study site uh yeah next slide. so there was a whole uh, range of uh, things that we learned but the next slide the main uh initial learning was that the 
interactions between humans and leopards were not as rare as we thought they were and what we might characterize as negative interactions or aggressive interactions where there might be livestock loss or human injury or human death even were only a subset of all the interactions that people were having with leopards in that landscape so uh, non-aggressive interactions were more a norm than a rarity and all these neutral interactions made up a huge body of knowledge for the people in the landscape and it seemed like they knew a lot about the leopard about their ecology about their behavior that they would hunt at the neck and they would drag the prey away uh, from where they uh, from the hunt and uh, <laughs> eat it in hiding almost and that they would live in riverine areas uh, during the day and then come out, come out at night and things like that. So it was, it was, uh, it showed that they were observing the leopards and uh, accumulating knowledge about them. And that the fact that they were willing to do that itself is so important for conservation, right? Because if someone is watching the animal that they're living with and trying to understand how they are and what their behavior is, how they uh, how they are then that that creates this willingness to share the space with them and the way they describe these animals were also really nuanced and complex uh, I guess almost as a consequence of being familiar with this animal I guess uh, because they would describe them as shy natured and fearful and quick and abusive and they would say they're very clever, they would say they're very mysterious, which was so different. The language that they used was so different from uh, what you would read in newspapers, because very often it would be more man eaters and beasts, and those were the terms that are often used. But here, the language that I heard associated with the leopard was very different. Uh, next slide. And also, uh, they spoke about the animal in such a way that it seemed as though they believed that they think about the animal as capable of thinking, right? So they, if, if we thought that another being is capable of thinking for themselves and responding to a situation rather than being instinct driven and always acting in a set patterned way, then, uh, then it creates a space for negotiating with them rather than saying that they will always act in the way that they do. Right? So, for example, uh, one of the shepherds was explaining that if a leopard comes, he would chase the leopard away, not just to chase it for that moment, but so that he would learn that this is a dangerous area or these are dangerous people who he shouldn't mess with. So, uh, it was it showed that they thought about leopards as, as being able to negotiate that kind of a relationship. And this is something that uh, has been acknowledged in many societies across the world, but is often associated with animism and indigenous societies. But uh, the community that I was learning about was not quintessentially indigenous. And, uh, it was mostly made up of Hindus and belonging to what we might call mainstream religion. Uh, but I guess this also shows that there's a far, far reaching cultural aspect to thinking in different ways about animals rather than just uh, what we might associate with uh, specific animistic societies. So a really important part of uh, trying to understand these subjective truths that we were talking about earlier is uh, mythology and stories that exist in a landscape because they are, uh, so myths are understood to be the way through which people make sense of the world that they're living in, right? These stories help us understand the world that we live in. So. If we look at the stories that are there in a landscape, we can get 
some uh, clue as to how they think about the world or how they teach you to live in this world. So uh, I was trying to ask them what stories they have, if they have stories about lepers. And the one statement that I got recurrently in the landscape was that uh, they would say, which means uh, the cat is the leopard aunt. And it was such a unusual statement for me that I got really curious and I would ask everyone, what, what does it mean? What does it mean? And then one of them told me a story about how uh, the leopard didn't know how to hunt and uh, it would go around from animal to animal trying to ask how to hunt. And uh, eventually it went to the leopard, it went to the cat. The leopard went to the cat and asked her, how do you, how do you attack your prey? And the cat explained to the leopard that you have to attack at the jugular vein, called the kukri. Uh, and from the cat, the leopard how to hunt. And uh, so they consider the relationship between the leopard and the cat as that of uh, aunt and a nephew. And that specific relationality is very revealing of how they think about the animal world. Because we might have categorized the world into uh, things that make sense to us in terms of families and genes and species and so on. But uh, what this shows is that they have categorized it according to, uh, according to what makes sense to them, which is an interrelated familial kind of relationship. Uh, Uh, next slide. Yeah. So, uh, so these these stories reveal a lot, and also there are things that we would uh, like to jump at as positive associations with the animals, right? Uh, one such uh, belief that can easily be uh, characterized as a positive association is that of uh, a protector and that's there in many cultures across uh, South Asia uh, but here they would associate the tiger or the leopard with uh, the Devi Maka Vahan which means the goddess's vehicle and so they believe that the leopard is a protector and would protect people when they're in danger especially when they're walking through forests that leopards would help them find their way home and like protect them from other evils and so on. So, uh, so we, yes, it is a positive association, but at the same time, that same sentiment of protection that the leopard invokes also uh, has also extended to the belief that if they wear a leopard claw, or a leopard whisper on them as a necklace, then that would give them protection. Now, uh, there's nothing to say that, you know, leopards are harmed because of that belief, but what we might consider as a positive association might, might have consequences that we don't yet understand. And therefore, I would uh, move away from trying to see if there are positive things or negative things within. Like it's, it's far more complex and unless we understand religion as a whole, we cannot pick and choose beliefs from within the system that we like and try to uh, enhance it because we don't know uh, how it plays out. Yeah, next slide. So we often think of stories and myths to be very, very ancient. And some of them are, some of them have been there for generations together, even centuries, we don't know. But there are also stories that are more new. And these newer stories can also have a huge impact on how, uh, how something is perceived in the present day. So uh, a new age myth, or what can be called a conspiracy theory that was there in the landscape was that a lot of them believe that the forest department has released leopards into the surrounding area as a protective measure so that people would uh, 
not going to these sea pine and other plantation areas. So they would make a distinction between what they call paltu tendwa, paltu leopard, which is domesticated leopard and uh, a wild leopard. And all the stories and things that I said until now, they would say that this ascribed only to the wild leopard that had been there, whereas what is there now and what attacks livestock or kills humans, uh, all that they associate with the uh, with the domesticated leopard because it already knows it has been almost tamed by humans and uh, are exposed to human beings. So uh, what such beliefs do is that they, uh, they change the, they change the way that the animal is perceived. What, what was an animal in itself is now uh, a vehicle for the government's intention, right? So the way that the animal is perceived is as an agent of the government rather than as a individual thinking being that's capable of, that they're capable of negotiating with. So this creates a really interesting dynamic that has to be understood before we, oh, also uh, where this conspiracy theory might be coming from. Uh, so we were talking to the first department people also, and then that showed that, uh, for example, translocation of the animals can be misconstrued and spread as rumors as the release of domesticated leopards into the landscape. It could be, but the, the idea is that, I guess what I was trying to draw attention to is that uh, even things that we might not think have uh, effect on the social or the perception level uh, can have a consequence at a perception level could be. So we have to understand how uh, how our actions can have consequences at a psychological level or a social level as well. Uh, yeah, next slide. So put it, putting it all together, uh, uh, I would say that it's it's a complex thing to understand. Perception is rather complex to understand, but uh, fleshing out different aspects of it by tapping into the subjective truths of people to reveal narratives in a landscape that you might not necessarily know this. And uh, it's only happenstance that I went to Himachal and started studying uh, this community and it's revealed that there's all this going on. Uh, and I'm sure that there are many places across India and across the world that have their own narratives and subjectivities that can be really interesting to study. So yeah, I would like to conclude by saying that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Di, for your lovely talk. Uh, I would uh, like to invite Sahil, uh, who will give the next talk, and we'll keep all the questions for the end. There is a Q&A box on this app where you can type in your questions and address it to whoever you want it addressed to. So the next talk, Dr. Sahil Nijavan is going to give it. He has a joint degree in anthropology from the University College London as well as an ecology from the Zoological Society of London, UK. And he's going to talk about the work that straddles both anthropology as well as ecology of the Idu Mishri tigers from Arunachal Pradesh. Um, yeah. So Manish, can we have Sahil's talk on? Well, Y'all can hear me. Can I can. You? Yeah, OK, yeah. Yeah. cool. Um, one second. Um, right. Um, can you just to confirm? Are you able to see the screen and are you able to hear me? Hear me, right? Can't see the presentation. Can only see your face. Ah, okay. Because I didn't share the screen. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, there you go. How about now? Yeah, better. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, can you make it uh, PP, yes. like the uh, yeah, perfect. It's it's full screen now. Cool. Um, thank you so much, Vidya, for having me today. And I'm so happy to be sharing space with Dhi and Tarsh. Uh, Tarsh, who I about haven't met, but Dhi, who I've known for some time and has really admired her work. Um, so before you know, I go in to present the story that I wanted to talk about today, just two quick disclaimers. Um, the story that I'm about to tell today is not mine. I'm just a vehicle to tell the story of the tigers and the Idu people. So I, my attempt would be to tell the story with as much respect as I can. Um, the second is that throughout the presentation, you'll see uh, that many faces of people are blurred out. And that is because I wasn't able to obtain the consent of those people to use their pictures. So their faces are hidden. Now, um, the, you know, my, my hope in sharing the story with you is because it made me learn and grow as a person and as a professional. And I'm hoping that there will be elements in it uh, for different people to take away um, and use in you know, the way they do conservation or they look at the world. Um, a lot of the things that I'm going to say are actually going to reinforce what Dee has talked about, but then there will be newer elements too because I work in a different area with a different people who see their world differently from the world that these respondents see. Um, now, I, um, before I start, I want to introduce this man that you see on the screen. His name is Sipa Melo. I lovingly call him Nava Sipa. Naba means uh, father in the Idu language. Um, now, Naba Sipa is a shaman. He's uh, actually a really powerful shaman. And shamans are sort of like priests, for, but they are priests for animists, uh, people who believe in animism, and they negotiate the world between the people, the spirits, and sometimes the world of the wild animals. Uh, what makes Naba Sipa really special and powerful is not that he's just one of the 70 odd remaining shamans in the Idumishmi community. But the fact that he's also a shape-shifting tiger. Idu people believe that their shamans are tigers in human disguise. And they rely on the power of the tiger to protect the people. It's the experiences of life as lived by people such as Nabasipa and others in the Bang Valley that has kept me there for over eight years now. But what attracted me to the Bang Valley wasn't shape-shifting tigers. What attracted me there were the actual tigers, the tigers in flesh and blood, uh, the tigers that at the turn of the century in around 2010 were fewer than 3,000 um, across the world in the wild. The tiger that is endangered and the tiger on which millions and millions of dollars is spent every year to conserve wild populations. Um, I... Um, to take you to where the Bang Valley is and where I was, um, you know, this is Arunachal Pradesh in yellow and the Bang Valley you can see is, that, is, a, is a river basin of the river, the Bang, um, colored in green. It's now divided into two administrative districts, the Bang Valley district on the top and the lower is the lower the Bang Valley district. I was actually sent to uh, this area in 2011 when I was working for a, a global conservation organization to look for signs of tigers. There were indications that tigers lived in some of these foothill forests that were connected through riverine islands to tiger habitats down in Assam. And so I went there to find tigers. I did find signs of tigers. They were there in those low elevation areas. But when I was there, people kept telling me that if you really want to find lots and lots of tigers, you have to go further deep into the valley and also higher up on the mountains. Now, it wasn't my mandate to go to either of those places when I was sent there in 2011. But that stayed in my head because it conflicted with what I, at that time, as a conservation biologist, had learned about tigers. You know, we, when tigers around, like I said, around two, 2010 were heavily endangered, they existed in heavily guarded, protected areas managed by governments and NGOs, tiger reserves as we call them in India. And to find lots of tigers in a valley which was mountainous, high elevation, there didn't seem like there was a ton of prey for tigers and which was not protected legally by the government, didn't really seem plausible to me. But it stayed in my head and a year later I returned and I asked my Idu friends and the people who had told me these stories to take me to these places where they told me the tigers lived. And they did. And everywhere they took me, we found signs of tigers. 
whether it was in the valley bottoms, which were about 1,800 to 2,000 meters above the sea level, or whether it was at the tops of the mountains at 3,000 meters right at the tree line, uh, butting heads up against snowy mountain tops. I was shocked. I didn't expect that, and yet I was finding tiger signs everywhere. From what I heard from people's stories, tigers seemed to be widespread. People had interactions with them. If they hadn't physically actually seen a tiger or encountered one in the jungle, they'd heard of someone or met someone in their family who had. The stories were quite prevalent. The question that I asked myself at that time was, why were these tigers there? You know, as someone who was trained in the mindset that tigers existed where we saved them, this seemed really challenging to my worldview. I mean, this, this was this area which didn't have any tiger reserves. It was right at the border with, border with Tibet, where we know that most tigers end up dead, having, uh, you know, either being utilized there in traditional Tibetan medicine or making their way into other parts of China and Southeast Asia for use in traditional Asian medicine. And we, I was finding lots of tigers. So what, who was protecting tigers here, why they were there, when we knew that tigers were actually plummeting in numbers in regional tiger reserves like Nam Dafa, Kamlang, uh, and they weren't doing so well in, other, in, in Dampa either, um, all of which are in the Northeast. Um, so that's the question I asked. And before I get to how I unraveled the answer to this question, let me first take you to the Bang Valley and show you uh, the place, the awesome, amazing place that it is. So the Bang Valley is the ancestral homeland of the Idu Mishmi people. Uh, there are fewer than 15,000 Idus in total in the world, uh, most of which most of whom trace their lineage to the Bang Valley. Um, Idus are what we call traditional animus. Um, animus believe that very important and defining human dispositions of morality, of conscious decision-making, of culture, of social, you know, sociality, actually are not just, uh, uh, they don't just belong to humans, they also belong to animals and spirits. So like he said, um, you know, Idus believe that spirits and animals are able to think, they're able to actively make decisions, they live in their own societies. So the world of the animus are surrounded by all of these different beings that are at once you know, aspiring towards their life, life worlds. They're trying to make their own worlds. They're making decisions. Um, and when your world is surrounded by everyone who's able to think in addition to the people, then it is, becomes a completely different world. Um, now, the Yidu community is, in terms of raw numbers, fairly small, but it is by no means a homogenous community. It is socially and economically very diverse. On the one hand, you have the Idus that are as wealthy as um, you know you can judge from from mainstream standards. You know they send their children to schools and in other cities, own cars and big houses, and are very politically connected. And on the other end of the scale are Idus that live about three to four days walk from the nearest road and depend entirely on natural resources and, and the forest to the to a large extent. Um, in the lower hills. Um, about 10 to 15 percent of the Idus have started to convert into Christianity more recently and increasingly also to Hinduism. Uh, but in the upper Dibang Valley, where I, most of my work was, uh, under 8 percent of the Idus are, have cur currently converted to Christianity, so a large percentage have remained animic. Now, Idus have a very unique animal, a domestic animal, which looks like this. It's called the Mithun. It's actually a domestic animal that is uh, kept by um, an overwhelming majority of communities in the mountainous region of Northeast India from Arunachal Pradesh down into Nagaland. Mithuns are sort of semi-domesticated ancestral versions of the wild gaur. Mithun are free ranging. They're found in the forest. They just kind of just, you know, sort of free range, but they're owned, they're, they always have owners. Um, and so I'll just like to keep, for you to keep this in mind as we move ahead. Uh, now let me take you to what the area looks like. And it's, uh, it's just a treat to the eyes and to the senses. You know, you, as you uh, drive towards the Bang Valley, you're greeted by a wall of green mountains that are steep and covered in a carpet of dense dark green. You can see that these slopes are really uh, steep and unforgiving. 
But as you drive deeper into the valley and also higher up the mountains, the landscape takes on a completely different mood. Um, these are, you know, it opens up, you get these grasslands that have a definitive, um, that are a production of interaction of people and geological processes. And in these grasslands, um, you know, pine strands go ne grow next to uh, banana and bamboo and ferns and all kinds of amazing life. Um, the valleys open up again as you drive towards the Tibetan border and you've got pine interspersed with grasslands and subtropical and temperate forest. Uh, they op the valleys open up even more um, and you have snow that covers even the valley bottoms and the mountain tops for many months in the winter. At the tops of the mountains, you have hundreds of these high elevation lakes. Now this high mountain landscape is actually really important for the Yidu. And it's a landscape that's really interesting for an outsider such as myself. Um, it's at these elevations and this high mountain area that the most powerful spirit of the mountain, uh, the one that owns all the wild animals lives. The spirit is called Gong. And it's in these lakes that Gongo sometimes dwells. So when you go into an area that is not yours, the forest does not belong to the people. Uh, the forest is the property of Golo and the animals are his property too. You have to follow the rules that Golo ancestrally created for all Idus. And these are the rules uh, that, these rules permeate all aspects of uh, per, your a person's performance and behavior. You know, you have to go in with purity of heart, spirit, and action. You can't have greed and, and deceit in your mind. You, whatever you find, you share uh, with your fellow people who go there. You can't speak loudly. Um, and these are also places in which are stepping stones in places where the spirits of the dead Idus stop on their journey to the, to the afterlife. And it's this journey that a shaman officiates and the shaman guides the spirit to the afterworld. And this journey takes five days and the spirit stops in about 175 named locations. So th this landscape is of immense importance for the people and also for the animals and the spirits that live there. And finally, you know, higher up in these elevations, the, the atmosphere, the climate is just very fickle. You know, you, we went, this was an unfortunate and an unfortunate morning. We went into our tents at night um, on a starry night and the morning when we wanted to go, go out, we couldn't open up our tents because we had been snowed in. So the, it, the mood changes here in a, in a quick second. And it's these, this fickleness of this environment that actually relates to how people understand this, this area and these high mountain spaces. Now, coming back to how um, I went about my research, I spent a total of 22 months altogether in the Bang Valley between 2013 and 15, all of which I spent living with local families. Um, and from the very beginning, I really wanted to understand what it is like to be one with the landscape and to understand animals and the forest through an Idu perspective. So I began to learn the Idu language. Um, and at the same time, I went into the forest to understand the tigers and the prey animals there. But I didn't really know how many tigers there were. There was no baseline data at that time. This was the first ecological study on those tigers. Um, so I started by placing camera traps. And over the two years that I was there, I placed hundreds of camera traps across the mountains of the Bang Valley, uh, carefully sampling different villages and their, their community-owned forests, and also a protected area in the north of the of the district that I'll come to in a second. Um, my camera traps revealed a world of uh, animal life, which even surprised me. Of course, uh, there were uh, tigers, big and small. I was able to uh, document 12 individual tigers. Eight of them were adults, four were one-year-old cubs, and two were fairly young cubs. Um, and uh, of these 12 tigers, I'm sorry, um, Eight lived in the community forest and uh, about four of them were in the protected area that I'll come to in a second. I also found clouded leopards, about 13 of those, but we've since recorded uh, evidence of about 16 individual clouded leopards. Uh, so they were quite prevalent there. Um, also golden cat, um, this is the Asiatic golden cat, golden in color where it gets its name, but this is also a golden cat. So is this. So is this, 
so is this, and so is this. In the Bang Valley, six different color variations of golden cats are found all in this one uh, riverine ba river basin. And so it's a really diverse area, not just in terms of species, but also sort of diversity within the species. And we have now, uh, I mean, there's a paper that I published on this last year, and it turns out that the Bang Valley has the highest uh, color diversity of any wild cat species anywhere in the world. Um, we also found flourishing populations of wild dogs. Um, they were really interesting because the pack sizes changed depending upon where you were in the valley. The higher elevations had smaller pack sizes and then the lower elevation, they were, they were larger. Um, and then there was this animal, um, which I didn't know what it was when I initially got there, but then it has since captured my imagination. If I was doing a talk with you in normal times, face to face, I would ask you to guess the name of it. Uh, but since that's not happening, uh, I will just tell you, it's called the Mishmi Takin. It gets its name from the Mishmi communities that live uh, in the Eastern Himalayas to which it is endemic. Uh, Mishmi Takin is the, they're the nomads of the Eastern Himalayas, sort of like the wildebeest. They undertake massive uh, altitudinal migrations from lower elevations to, to higher elevations, depending upon the season. And then we also found um, that tigers in this landscape shared uh, their space with uh, uh, red pandas. Um, and these amazing birds, uh, the pheasants on your left is the Temenix trichopan, and on the right is the male uh, Himalayan uh, mona. Um, so what I found was, so this, uh, allow me to introduce this map to you really quickly. Um, Anini here is the district headquarters. Uh, what is shaded in the dark, um, uh, sorry, the dark brown uh, is the wildlife sanctuary called the Bang Wildlife Sanctuary. It measures 4,920, uh, uh, 4,000, oh, 4,129 square kilometers, sorry, had a brain freeze, that, freeze for a minute. Um, and by all means, it's a paper park. You've got about five park staff on the ground. Um, it is one of the largest wildlife sanctuaries in the country. Uh, the light greens are all the forests and mountains that are community owned. And all of the points are the cameras uh, locations that I placed. Um, in this valley over here in, inside the wildlife sanctuary, I found no evidence of tigers. I did find evidence of tigers here in this valley inside the protected area and both of these community forests down here. Um, and what I found was that when I compared these two sites in terms of densities of tigers, uh, the density of tigers in the community forest was 4.5 times higher than the density of tigers inside this valley in the protected area. Um, I estimated that the entire Idu landscape uh, can house as many as 52 individual tigers, most of which would be found in the community-owned forest um, in the area. And during the question and answers, I'll be very happy to explain the differences between these kind of the ecological and anthropogenically driven differences between these observed differences in densities of tigers. But I'm going to move on for now. Um, so obviously, you know, there's a flourishing population of tigers and a large proportion of them dwell in relative proximity of people um, in areas that are first and foremost uh, the Idu peoples. And, and that's the landscape that the, the tigers and other animals share with people and, and Idu spirits. Um, in terms of prey, tigers need um, to, to thrive. Tigers need you know, direct per, uh, protection from persecution, but they also need a regular supply of large, abundant wild uh, prey species, and they need habitat. So I was looking into these other factors as well. And wild pig is a prey species that's found there. I'm uh, estimated densities of wild pigs through uh, two as well in that area. In the green uh, and red and uh, blue, you see the densities of the three sites that I camera trap. And in the black are density estimates of this animal from other protected tiger reserves within the country and across the tiger range into Southeast Asia um, that have a similar ecological carrying capacity. And I found that the densities were actually comparable. Now, uh, same with munjak, which is a very important prey species for tigers there too. Uh, the densities in, my, in the Bang Valley were either equal to or slightly higher than the densities in other areas. 
Now, I don't actually believe that these densities are higher than uh, the protected sites, uh, uh, but again, I can address this question if someone is interested in the question and answers. Uh, suffice to say that the prey species there would seem to be doing really well, just as well as prey species in sites that are protected by NGOs and governments by excluding people from those lands. Um, now, again, this was this sort of confused me a little bit more because uh, here this was this area which seemed to contain animals um, equal, comparable to protected sites, but there was no legal official protection. So it was it was working as a protected area, uh, but at the same time, I also knew idus were hunting because I was there, I lived there, I partook in a lot of forest trips when this was happening. Hunting was an important part of daily life, as, as it is for many traditional people. Um, and it's an important activity through which people to realize and create their identities. Um, so when hunting was happening, you know, the notion that's ingrained in our minds is that all hunting anywhere always is bad, and it takes away from conservation. I wanted to understand how hunting here was actually sustainable because, like I said, wildlife populations were comparable to those in protected sites. And the answer to my questions lay in a practice that I was slowly being introduced to by daily living there, which was called the Iduena. And what I found was that all aspects of Idu life came with restrictions in actions that a person could do. Now, there were restrictions that were attached to funerals, to childbirth, to marriage, to marriageability, to war. There's no longer any war that used to happen in the past. Uh, the, <laughs> the only war that we're fighting right now is in Ladakh with the Chinese, uh, but I digress. Um, and with farming, with shamanic ceremonies, the festivals of all kinds, with hunting, with tree felling, with house building, all of these activities, if someone engaged in, then have to follow some restrictions. And these restrictions were collectively called ena. But one thing became quite apparent as I saw my family members, my Idu host family members follow ena, and then I followed ena along with them whenever I went to these social activities too, is that Whenever there were social activities, such as funerals and childbirth and all the ones that I've mentioned, there was a restriction in going into the forest, consuming wild meat, and then, in, you know, then partaking in these social activities. Likewise, for people who had hunted or had eaten wild meat, which they had even been give, either been given or they had killed themselves, um, they had to then... Uh, prevent themselves from engaging in these social activities. So a clear separation was emerging uh, that to be able to be a person which was defined as partaking in your social life, you had to take, you had to remove yourself temporarily from engaging in the forest and vice versa. Um, now, the, when it came to, you know, the, the restrictions in terms of the forest and hunting, there were, this was a multi-tiered restrictive environment. There, there were lots of restrictions. And the first tier was these animals that you see on your screen, which was wild felines and the hula gibbon. Um, there was a complete ban uh, and a complete restriction on hunting of any of these species. Um, and um, the reason for that is an ancestral story that most Idu people will tell you if you go there and you start talking about tigers, as I often did which is the story of the brotherhood of, of, the, the, of the man, of the first man and the tiger. It was belief that the ancestral couple gave birth to two sons. One was a tiger and the second was uh, the, an Idu man from whom all the Idus descend. When the, the tiger immediately went into the forest and never came back to the village. When the Idu child grew up to be a man, he went into the forest once to hunt, met his brother tiger, got into a disagreement, and then uh, conspired to kill it. It managed to kill the tiger, but the creator was so engrieved and enraged at the act of seeing a man kill his own brother that, he, that it recreated the tiger and sent it to the high mountains to live, where it still lives to this point, away from the villages of its Idu brothers, and told both the Idu and the tiger that if any of them wanted to kill the other, then the living, that the murderer uh, will have to face the ancestral curse. And it is this, this story, this 
uh, view of what a tiger is that kind of plays out every single time, um, you know, actual physical and spiritual interactions with tigers occur. And so, uh, because you would, as you, you would not kin, kill your kin, your relatives, Hindu people have observed a very strong restriction and taboo on killing wild animals. A similar story goes for the Hula Gibbon. That's why the Gibbons are not killed as well. Uh, but there is another, you know, there's this other uh, cohort of animals, all of which are tiger prey. You know, on the upper left, this is a Gongshang Manjak, which is also endemic to Eastern Himalayas, in addition to the um, the, the Indian manjak, the wild pig, the takin, and Himalayan serow, all of these large animals, um, when you kill them or you eat their meat, um, hunters um, or any meat eaters have to observe for, for f hunters for five days cannot engage uh, in any sexual relations, cannot share quarters with any women in their family, have to separate their bedding utensils and everything that they touch from the people in the family who do not eat meat, cannot go in all the social events where a shaman is present that I've told you about earlier, cannot eat meat that comes from a place where there has been a wedding or a childbirth, um, cannot wash clothes for an entire lunar cycle, and cannot um, uh, eat a number of foodstuffs with the meat. So it has to be eaten boiled without chilies, without garlic, onion, and a number of different foodstuffs. Um, so it has to be eaten under this very strict um, uh, observance. Uh, and anyone who hasn't killed still uh, eats the meat has to do all of this too. And if I haven't eaten meat, but I come into contact with someone who has, and I don't maintain physical separation, that, then that, these restrictions and this taboo jumps to me, and I have to observe them too. What, therefore, anyone who's eaten meat has to maintain complete physical separation. And there's, there's restriction on all these animals because again, these animals are not the property of the people to take whenever they wished uh, to. This is the property of Golo, the high mountain spirit. And these taboos are a way of paying Golo back in behavior, in observance, a price for taking one of his, one of his animals. Um, and one important thing here is that um, Idu women, when they come of age and when they experience their first um, uh, period, their first menarche, um, sorry, I'm gonna, <laughs> my mouth is drying up. So Idu women, from the point that they first experience their, their, you know, their menstrual cycle and throughout their uh, reproductively active life until menopausal stage, Idu women don't eat the meat of these large animals. Instead, um, men in their family uh, try to supply meat of smaller animals, rodents, fish, um, birds, um, insects to a certain extent um, to the women. And these smaller animals are not believed to have strong spirits, so they're not dangerous to the women. And I'll come to this gendered aspect in a little bit. Um, so there was these restrictions on tiger prey in addition to the tiger. Um, and um, you know, this is just uh, one of the many ways. And this image photo that was actually taken by a colleague of mine, Ambika, um, and I credit her for this photo. Uh, what I found uh, was that through a mixture of quantitative data that I collected over a year and um, also qualitative understanding of, of the value of the importance of these taboos is that during taboo periods, the meat consumption reduced by as much as 88%. So it really was controlling people's uh, dependence on wild resource and wild meat in that area. Um, um, again, I acknowledge this photo, which was taken by Ambika. Uh, but I, you know, the, the, the role of women in this relationship is very important and very interesting and something that wasn't available to me in the first year that I spent in the Bang Valley because I was primarily in the forest with men, which is a, was a highly gendered space where only men go. And it was only in the second year which I was, where I wasn't going into the forest as much and I was spending more and more time with my host family and also with my Idu collaborators, Achili and, and Iho, um, who then introduced me to this world of how women saw their, their relationship with the forest. Um, you know, Idu women, like I said, don't eat the meat of large animals, but they also um, control how men engage with, with wildlife. Um, and, you know, and, and I'll, allow me to explain. Um, 
the you know the the reason if you ask the shamans there why do you do women not eat wild animals they'll tell you that women in Hindu culture are considered to have weak, weaker spirits and it's a common sort of perception across traditional cultures and because these wild animals have very strong subjective you know spirits they're very strong um, beings it can endanger the women um, and also because women carry the blood of humanity. They're the ones that give birth to people. Um, and these big animals carry the blood of the forest. This, these two bloods cannot mix. Um, therefore, women are removed from consumption of wild animals once they become reproductively active and start menstruating, making this blood visible. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the, the way this plays out in everyday life, it sort of turns this power dynamics on its head. Um, I'll, I'll use this example that one of my uh, host um, mothers told me, you know, we have young kids. I can't have my husband eat wild meat, come back home and touch things in the house. I can't use them or wash clothes for a month. That's just not feasible. So he just sleeps outside when he eats meat. Ha <laughs> ha. You know, um, if, if you are someone who has little children and they play in dirt, and they dirty their clothes every day and you need to wash the clothes on a regular basis. And your husband is eating meat in the house regularly, touching all of the things and transferring the taboo on you. And one of the things about this taboo is not being able to wash clothes. And that's just becomes really difficult. I mean, how many new clothes are you gonna buy? So a lot of these women actually don't allow their husbands to eat meat. And I would speak to men who would say that, oh, I, you know, it's been such a long time since I had meat. And sometimes when they would eat meat, they wouldn't come back to their house. So in a way, there was this sort of power struggle between the two genders when it came to uh, the realm of the forest. But another sort of character in the story or the, the person that played a very significant role in, in uh, controlling people's interaction with the forest was the shaman. You know, nothing in the life of an animist person is chance. It just doesn't happen. There's no coincidences. Everything is a result of something that you did. So when a mishap happens to someone, if your child is sick or you've had an accident or your pigs are dying, um, you know, you'll go to a shaman. The shaman will look into your life. And almost always the shaman will tell you that this is happening because you didn't follow blah, 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 this or that taboo. So in this way, they reinforce the idea that to be able to be, have a prosperous life, you have to follow um, these rules of morality that are created for the people by the ancestors, which involves restrictive hunting and, and being careful when you go into the forest. Um, so, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I've told you the story of how complex these interactions are that, you know, people are not just interacting with this animal tiger, they're interacting with thinking beings that just look different from themselves, but they're all people, they're all persons. All these animals are actually persons who think and, and live in their own societies. Now, to answer the question, why are what, there tigers in the Bang Valley? And I think there are a number of overlapping reasons. Um, the first is the Idu land use and ownership system, which I didn't have the time to go into. Again, very happy to talk about in question and answers, but this is a traditional land ownership system that has kept uh, the, the natural forest in, in, in intact. Um, uh, the second are the, the prey, the Anon tiger prey that I've spoken to you about. The third is the direct restriction on killing of tigers uh, through the ideas of kinship. And all of these function under the Indian constitution's mandate for Arunachal, which is the inner line permit, which prohibits entry and residency of um, non Arunachali citizens into the Bang Valley. And what this has done is that it hasn't, it has prevented an influx of population um, and has allowed customary laws to govern the land and the forest. Um, and, so a lot, and the population densities in these areas have uh, been very low, which again, low human density allows for, you know, higher, uh, you know, wildlife to be, to be present in fairly high densities. Although that's not always true as Vidya's work shows that leopards and hyenas exist in rural landscapes with very high human densities reaching up to 300 uh, people per square kilometer, but it's definitely a contributing factor. Now I want to talk about two things really quickly. I want to very quickly dismantle this um, 
dichotomy and romanticized idea of either peaceful coexistence or conflict between humans and animals that exists in our minds. Um, Idus do not revere tigers. Uh, tigers are not gods. Tigers are fallible spirit animals. They're actual animals. They're a threat. Um, they, to live, to share your land and your lives with tigers is a constant everyday negotiation. It is difficult. It's not easy to live with a tiger. It's not easy to go into the forest knowing that there is a tiger there which can attack you. None of this is easy. It's a relationship that by far is mediated through fear. And if you talk to Idus, actually a lot of them don't even want to talk about tigers because just saying the name of this animal invokes ideas of fear. That's how powerful this animal is conceived to be. There is coexistence in this area, which is very problematic coexistence. It's very awkward. There's nothing peaceful about it because this is the way the world is. If you ask the Idus, you know, about tigers, they'll all tell you, most of them will tell you that, you know, they, they, they're dangerous, they kill our mithun, and mithun is, you know, it's a very, it's very expensive. Um, and we are afraid of going into the forest. And if you accidentally kill it in self-defense, or then it kills your entire clans because of the curse. But, you know, the tiger lives in the forest because it has always lived there. Um, so it's, it's, there's no clear conflict here, neither is there a clear coexistence. It's a, it's a range of emotions that every day change uh, on, a, on a daily basis. Um, and finally, the future of this area. I mean, I feel like a lot of you would be aware of the ongoing uh, controversy and debate in, in the social media about the Bang Valley and the number of dams that are planned there. Um, at the same time, there are plans to upgrade the wildlife sanctuary that I showed you in earlier slides into a tiger reserve. Um, and the scientific argument that is being used to promote that is to say that these tigers only live in these high elevation areas. Uh, the Bang Wildlife Sanctuary, about 65% of it is above 3,500 meters square. Um, I think uh, I, my, the, the scientific analyses and the data that I collected do not support that. I think tigers, I found that tigers there use this landscape vastly. Uh, lower areas, higher areas. We found same tigers in low valleys and the same ones at the tops of the mountains. Um, and I think through the division of this landscape into dams and tiger reserves, you know, we're, we're forcing this area to reflect the way we see this world and not the way the world of the Idu and the tigers exist. Um, which is we see the world through our lens of dichotomies, you know, development here and tiger reserves here because only we can save tigers, only we know how to save them in tiger reserves. Um, and I think it's this model uh, which um, we're bringing into this world without understanding and by using science that is very politically driven uh, is going to destabilize this existing relationship, which though is awkward and contentious between people and tigers, but it works. It's a special relationship that, you know, we have lost from a lot of different places. I do need to say at this point that the, the views on dams are very complex and there are lots of locally do people that support the dams while there are lots of people in the area that do not uh, support it. So it's a very complicated um, issue and it needs to be said also that the Bangali is really remote and development there hasn't arrived and there's a real need for schools and hospitals um, there as, as there is in any other part of the country. With that, I'm gonna end my talk. I'm sorry if I went over time. Um, thank you so much, Vidya. You haven't unmuted, yeah. Vidya. Yeah, thanks. Um, am I audible? No, still not. Yeah. Um, yeah. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Great. Sal, thanks again for the talk. It was fascinating. Um, and I think you have a lot of questions. I would, um, I would, I'll go to Tarsh's talk because there are a lot of, uh, you know, all these three talks kind of merge into each other. You will figure out once Tarsh. And then at the end, you can, you know, ask your, they will answer your questions. So the last talk is by Dr. Tarsh 
Teke Kara, I hope I got the surname right, who's just <clears throat> finished his PhD on the human elephant <clears throat> relationships in the Nilgiris, Tamil Nadu. And uh, just to point out here that elephants have been studied a lot by many, many ecologists in India, but these are largely done when elephants are living in the natural landscapes. And this is one of the few studies where he's actually studying the elephants when elephants are sharing space with humans. And I think it's, you know, it's these kind of studies which will help us move forward uh, in terms of negotiating our shared spaces with these animals. He did his MSc in Oxford and his PhD at the Open University in the UK. And uh, Tarsh, thanks for joining in. Please go ahead. You have to unmute your... <clears throat> Yeah, I had to be unmuted yeah. by the host. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Yeah, I can. Come Great. On. Thanks, uh, Vidya. And I'll jump straight into it. Uh, hopefully, we can have uh, some time at the end of it to talk about some sure. of these issues. Yeah. Is my screen visible? No. Not yet. Host has disabled screen sharing. Can you enable screen sharing? Uh, I think you probably doing it. Did it happen? Not yet? I guess Manish? It's an Manish, can you en it's an enable screen share? And yeah. Yeah, is that working? Yes, it is. Thanks, Tarsh. Just make it full screen. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Great. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks, Vidya, for hosting this. It's a great set of talks. Uh, more than anything, I've been particularly uh, interested and uh, excited to listen to all of the other work happening with leopards and tigers and other landscapes. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, I'll jump straight in, as I said, uh, hopefully to keep some time for questions. Um, and the first part is that this is not all my work. There's a lot of hard work that's gone in from lots of other people. Arun, Ramesh, Vishnu and Prakash uh, and Mani Kandan at the Shola Trust. Uh, they're four kind of indigenous local boys who kind of have grown up here and have a deep understanding of elephants. I learned a lot from them as well uh, through the course of my work. And equally so the local forest department, field staff themselves, the two people you can see here escorting the nation, for example, have a huge amount of knowledge about elephants and I've learned a lot from all of them as well, uh, which I'm kind of presenting here today. So first up, the context of this area, I'm not sure how many of you know about it, but it's a kind of human dominated landscape in the middle of a sea of kind of protected areas and natural habitats. Um, it's a good little forest division, a part of the Nilgiris, and uh, kind of overflows into other land, other divisions around as well. But it's basically one landscape that's surrounded by forests. And the traditional kind of idea that we can put up barriers to keep elephants out is just not relevant, uh, particularly because nobody told elephants. Uh, this is OVT7, Alibaba Bashir, Alibaba because he can break any fence. Uh, he learned how to use his tusks to break electric fences. And he passed on that knowledge to lots of other elephants and it became a huge problem that fences uh, were not very uh, effective at all in keeping elephants out. Um, tusks don't conduct, so yeah, that's a slightly sophisticated understanding of electricity there that he's acquired. The other kind of key thing is um, elephant proof trenches. But this is a high rainfall area and as you can see elephants kind of, after one monsoon, the trench that was quite deep is no longer that deep and elephants are able to go in and out. So I kind of grew up in this landscape and I've kind of always had a sense that you can't really keep elephants out. If they want to go somewhere, there's very little you can do to actually stop them from going in that direction. And this is very evident with both of these kinds of key strategies to keep elephants out. Um, the other key thing to look at in terms of context is that um, there are in some areas very hard lines at the edges of PAs, right? This is just very close here. This is Bandipur to the north of here. And there is a very hard line you can see where forests end and where human habitation starts. But uh, down below is a kind of satellite Google Earth image of uh, the Goodlood landscape. 
and you can clearly see it's a completely kind of heterogeneous landscape that there's no separation between nature and uh, society or humans and wild animals, right? It's kind of totally mixed up. You can't tell where forests end and human habitation starts. The third key uh, issue to keep in mind in this landscape is land use. So this is a satellite image that shows most of it as green, right? It's uh, the green includes tea, coffee and natural vegetation. But as you can see this together, there's very little agriculture. It's basically lots of large tea plantations and coffee plantations. And these are not conflicting crops. So elephants can move through quite easily without uh, affecting the core of the local economy. That's a big point in terms of allowing people and elephants to live together or not. Um, another key issue is that the land is highly contested. What you see in light green is land that is classified legally as reserve forests and controlled by the forest department. What you see is green is actual natural vegetation in this landscape and the two don't match at all. So there are huge amounts of kind of natural habitats outside of this and that causes a huge amount of friction between people. Like the land story in the Nilgiris goes back 200 years. There were only indigenous people and then waves of migration into the area. And nobody, very few people really have completely clean uh, title for their land. And that's a huge source of conflict between uh, the forest department and the local people. Right? So you often see huge protests coming out, all of that. Uh, something that uh, Red Path et al. call conservation conflict, or conflict between different groups of people over wildlife. This is a very uh, kind of key part of this landscape. People are always fighting, which manifests itself in elephant interactions. Right? They, can't, they can't really claim title for their land, but if, if an elephant does something or if an elephant kills a person or if a tiger attacks a person, there are huge protests. And one of the key demands for that protest is give us land. So it's, it's elephants almost caught up in this conflict, which is primarily about land. Um, another key and uh, variable is how the people are distributed to this landscape. These are all the houses from Google Earth. Key takeaways are the people are vastly spread out everywhere. The same for elephants. The green is where elephants never come in the year. Red is where elephants are there throughout. Uh, orange, yellow is where they come sometimes in the year. And you can see elephants are also much spread out. When you put them both together, you see there are large areas where there are kind of elephant presence uh, all through the year and reasonably high density of people. So there aren't really conflict hotspots or they aren't really using the space differently. It isn't that, okay, this is a big forest division. Here are all the people and here are all the elephants and they kind of separate out. They do in some places, but there is also huge overlap. Um, and if you add forests as well, elephants are keeping to forests in many parts of uh, the landscape. Wherever there are forests, there are elephants also there. But elephants are also moving way beyond forests and uh, not limiting themselves to the forests. And uh, the final kind of key uh, variable I think that we need to keep in mind for this landscape is that the elephant distribution or use of the landscape is increasing. That was in 2013, we uh, mapped elephant presence. And 2018, we mapped elephant presence again. And elephants are clearly using a lot more of the landscape. They're seen much more frequently everywhere. Um, the narrative around humans is interesting. I haven't included that in this presentation. But it's a very standard narrative in conservation about human populations exploding, which happens a lot, no doubt. But in this particular uh, area, the Nilgiris uh, hasn't seen a net population increase uh, significantly. In the last census, actually, there's a negative population growth in the Nilgiris, but people have actually moved out from these areas into cities. So that narrative is important to keep in mind. It's not a case of what oh, people and elephants are just, I mean, elephant, people are exploding and elephants are taking a beating. Okay, elephants are kind of expanding their range. We don't know about numbers, right? This is a distribution and density are different things. And I'm kind of mixing up both here. But basically, that standard narrative is not that clear in this landscape. <coughs> the other key thing, um, the next kind of key variable in terms of interactions is people, human diversity and culture. This is something that uh, both Dee and Sahil have talked about. <coughs> so this is something I intrinsically knew because of my background. Uh, but there are, like I said, a huge number of indigenous people in this landscape. There are Paniyas, who are a traditional uh, hunter-gatherer tribe who uh, were in bonded labor to another community of the Chetis for a very long time. Um, but they, they don't own land, basically. They don't do cultivation. They primarily are now uh, agricultural laborers in other people's lands. There are Katanaikans, who are the kind of most forest-based of all the people in this region, and also the smallest in number. And they've kind of shied away from all of the government development schemes the most. Uh, 
they kind of if you just look at the map of where they exist they all exist at the fringe of forest and right? they form the buffer between gudlur and the forest uh, and mugumalai for example um and they are, their kind of whole life revolves around forest a lot there are a huge number of stories about how they don't have conflict so one of my key kind of starting points for this was i heard about a village tepakoli which is a katnaikan village that uh, they had a very good relationship with the elephants and they used to do a kind of animistic puja every year and so elephants never attacked their village elephants would attack all the other people around them but not them right this is something they believed very strongly and not just them all other people in the in the area also believed it everyone believes that yeah katnaikins are they can communicate with elephants and they've kind of have a good relationship with them and so there's no issues um, but lots of the others have a lot of problems immediately around so it's a bit of a kind of paradox almost um and newt bird david an anthropologist who's worked a lot with these people has a very nice story about um, how they communicate with elephants so there was a case of a man coming back to his house late one night um and he almost reaches his house and then he had a drink or so so he wasn't his senses weren't all about him but as he just almost reaches his house he sees a huge uh, elephant standing there and he's like it's too it's too close for him to actually run away he's like within a few meters of it so he just stops and he thinks for a while and then he says calmly in a very even voice he talks to the elephant and says i'm sorry i came close so close i'm sorry i had a drink today um and you can kill me now in any moment i know that but what do you gain from it i have a wife and child who are waiting for me at home you're not going to gain anything by killing it i'm going to lose a lot and i have this stick and i'll hit you at least once before you kill me so you have a little bit to lose if i actually hit you and the elephant peacefully walks away apparently right so this community very strongly a key part of the identity is that they can communicate with the natural world and the whole idea of animism where life exists in multiple other species not just animals like the wind has life and uh, other than human persons like the wind can be other another than human person a stone can be another than human person life exists well beyond human beings uh, the next is betakurmbas again a very interesting uh, tribe because currently most of the mahouts here in the mugumalai tiger reserve for example who manage the elephants are all from this tribe they are also a traditional hunter gatherer tribe um and most of their life also revolves around elephants uh, again one of the key stories i heard in the beginning when i started work was that uh, uh, we manage elephants but we don't cap it, capture elephants like all this forest department with all this uh, tranquilizing and uh, chasing it all these keda operations and all these violent things that they used to do before if we have to catch an elephant we just go up to a herd and tell them listen uh, we want to ask some of you all to please come and work for uh, important people kings i mean the narrative starts around we used to capture elephants for kings in the old days so the king has asked for some of you all to come and work for him does anyone want to volunteer and two or three elephants will walk out uh, from the herd and come to them and they take them and go for training now this is this is something that, again they all believe and uh, it's not just a story I, i i thought it was a story here but 1880 the manual for the nilgiris district the gazette here also mentions this that there are particular tribes who just go up to elephants and call them out to be captured right and to join that's how that is one of the kind of freak ways in which they used to capture elephants here apparently so these these narratives are very strong they can communicate with elephants um the next are mulukurumbas they are a settled agriculturalist tribe they also have lots of animistic beliefs but because their history of growing crops goes back a long way they have a much longer arguably slightly antagonistic relationship with elephants where they always have to protect their crops this is the key difference the hunter gatherers don't grow crops so elephants were never an issue because they never ate their crops and in all of these i kind of have a picture of kids up there because again this is something sahil mentioned uh, it's not a case that these are all very primitive kind of backward people living in the back of beyond in forests they are all very much a part of the mainstream cash economy in this landscape and the kids are all going to school they're very modern in many ways the next are chetis they're not classified as a tribe but they are again a traditional agricultural community who live inside mugumalai uh, they've been wanting to move out for example they filed a case in 2006 saying elephants are completely destroying their crops and they can't uh, stay inside so they want to move out um, so again they are a old community who have this re- relationship with elephants that goes back a long time but it's again slightly antagonistic in some ways and then there are kind of malayali immigrants who moved into the area from the 1960s onwards um, they were kind of the nilgiris the gudlur area in particular was a slightly free for all uh, people could come and kind of get land here uh, it was government almost encouraged it because gudlur nobody wanted gudlur it was a kind of wild place that was largely uninhabited so yeah they all moved in the 1960s they grow crops that elephants eat like bananas ginger uh, 
uh, rice, things like that. So there is a lot of conflict, negative interactions, and they don't have a baseline of or a history of interacting with elephants. So arguably they have a lot more trouble. And then there are Sri Lankan repatriates. I don't know if anybody knows the story. They were sad kind of case. People were moved from here to Sri Lanka, Tamilians to work on plantations. Uh, then they were moved back and forth. I mean, we can go into this later, but basically they had a lot of a really raw deal in terms of how they were repatriated uh, from there, came back, all of that. They were all settled in the Nilgiris and the, the government cleared huge tracts of forest to create plantations for them to work on. Uh, so they don't grow crops themselves. They work on plantations that elephants don't need, but they also don't have a history of working with, uh, of living with elephants. And finally, there are kind of local elites, uh, people who live in estates and own family owned estates in this landscape. Uh, they've all been here for about a hundred years and again, they themselves are quite secure in their big houses. So there isn't much uh, risk with elephants. Their houses are quite secure um, and they've, they've co-evolved with elephants over a hundred years, which I think is quite a long time in some ways. And I find that they are able to live with elephants reasonably well too. And all of these communities are hugely different. Um, I think this has come out quite strongly, so I'm not going to talk about it more, but this is a questionnaire survey we used to ask people what they thought was normal in terms of interaction with animals, right? You think it's inevitable that elephants will sometimes do some damage. And this is whether we can try to measure whether people are tolerant or not, or what, what uh, they thought was normal, whether they believe normative behavior included some kind of negative impacts on themselves. Uh, this will hopefully be out in a paper, so we can share more about this, uh, but I won't talk about it too much now. Um, so that was the first section. Basically, the takeaway is that the people are hugely different. Animism and that animistic beliefs play a huge role. I'll talk about it more in the conclusion. Um, um, and then the diversity in the elephants. This was the other key part of it. Um, nothing was known about the good elephants. We didn't know how many elephants there were. We didn't know anything. So the kind of key objective was let's at least start studying these elephants to get a sense of it. How many elephants actually use this region? What do we know about their demography in terms of age and sex and things like that? Are they permanently resident here or are they only moving through in particular areas? And this was my key interest. Are there differences in personality or behavioral types of elephants? So we had like an early warning system based on like the Balpare model. Um, I'll talk about this more. Text messages came in, uh, warning messages would go out. We would also go out and watch the elephants for extended periods of time to kind of watch how they were interacting with people. Um, we had, yeah, this used to be plotted on a map and it used to collect data. The key was that this kind of stopped partly because other than like opposite of what was happening in Balpare was happening here. When people got a warning message that there were elephants in a particular region, they would all go there in large numbers to see the elephants, right? Rather than move away to uh, be safe themselves. And it wasn't any risk because there were houses everywhere. So you'd always find a friend's house close by and they'll stand on a veranda at the friend's house and watch the elephants but it had the opposite effect of what we wanted. So we stopped the warning co component, but we used it as a, as a monitoring uh, project to get information about where elephants were. And this evolved into an app. Uh, I won't talk about that much more. But the key was we went around talking to field staff, but how to identify individuals. This is things that people have done um, in multiple places before. Varun Goswami has done this in Nagarhole. Vidya TNC has done a lot of this in uh, as well. It's not something new, but we kind of made this all very outward facing. It was all designed to uh, get all the local people to identify elephants individually. And this slightly goes against the tenets of biology, right? You should not anthropomorphize, you should not think of animals in human terms, but we wanted to do exactly that. Like we believe that not all the elephants were the same and we wanted people to relate to individuals rather than the whole species because we thought that could change the relationship. It was a kind of experiment that we started uh, primarily with local field staff. Um, with huge support from the forest department, I have to say this, uh, there was a very proactive chief conservator of forests, DFO and ACF at the same time, and all of them were very keen that we do something significant. And they're a key stakeholder in all of this that made a positive difference in this landscape. Um, so it's quite easy with males. Um, I don't know many of you may have seen this, tuskers, the shape of the tusks are key, or a tuskless male, a makana is quite easy. But with females, it's a lot harder. The top, that's Rani, she has her ear torn and you can see both those are her. The bottom two are kind of possibly uh, sisters in the same herd. Everything is the same, the shape of the ear, the amount it's folded on top, the shape of the back, everything, except there's a slight bump in one back and the other doesn't have a uh, bump. So it's quite hard to actually identify elephants easily, uh, quickly. So we had to use these kind of cards for each elephant. We made a profile and we said something about personality and description of the elephant and its behavior there as well, and shared this with the local staff primarily. 
Uh, and we had this kind of poster for each range telling what people, all the elephants that use that landscape, all of them were given names based on where they were, like Nadori Ganeshan, for example, Nadori is someone who walks about town, right? So he was a very kind of urban elephant, spent a lot of time in town. So he, the names all were linked to their kind of personality or behavior in some way or the other. So we won't go over this much, but basically over time, the key thing I'm trying to say is that we, this system is designed for the forest department and local people to get to know their own elephants better. So it started off with us doing all the work. Um, in the second year, 15% of the observations uh, and notes were by the staff. And by the third year, that went up to 35%. Um, hopefully we're hoping that they will completely take over. Um, and in terms of new individuals, right? We quickly, not quickly, over time, we kind of, you can see it plateauing. So we more or less, we think we are all the elephants that uh, we see now, we know already. So there are no new individuals using this landscape. So we believe we, we kind of know all the elephants in this area. Um, at the outset, the first thing was that these elephants are very different from elephants we see uh, or read about. This is Ganeshan sleeping in the middle of the day by the side of a road. You can't hear the sound, I think, but there's a bus going by horning and things like that. Um, they, are, they are different in their behavior in that they're not stressed by people in the way one would imagine that they should be stressed by people. Right? They're able to sleep, feed, reproduce everything alongside people, even with people watching. Uh, he wakes up as well, just in case anyone thought he was dead. That's him waking up after his two-hour afternoon siesta. So, um, yeah, they, the elephants were very different. Uh, other than their behavior, I'll come into that more later. But uh, uh, the kind of male-to-female ratio was a key aspect. Generally, around most parks in South India, it's about 1 is to 4. As to 0.7, right? There are more young males and young males. For media, we don't know why, and that's something that we need to look for. Um, the home range is another key. Uh, I won't talk about this much, but these are basically two elephants that we saw for the most. So we saw them every week. At least kind of, uh, they've been in the river. They haven't really gone far away, but then within a week again. And the home ranges are much smaller than the literature suggests. The male was 53 uh, square kilometers, Ganeshan, and Rani and her herd was just 29 square kilometers. So you are living in this human-dominated landscape, and it's not a it's not a forest by any stretch of imagination, right? You can just see the slivers of green in between are all the natural habitat there is. It's lots of houses, tea plantations, factories, offices, hospitals, schools, things like that. It's a very urban setting that they're living in. Um, there's a lot of text here, I won't go into it, but basically we wanted to classify elephants based on uh, four different variables, like the presence of the context of how many people were around them, how much the land use was modified around them, what was their reaction to people and what was their behavior over the period of the time that they were being watched by people, right? So these are four, three, four variables that go in increasing order of kind of disturbance. And um, so we saw elephants often, uh, I'll just let you look at this, I think it's self-explanatory, but it's basically, this is the kind of schematic we use to classify personality uh, or behavioral uh, response. I'll talk about this more. So the first one was elephants that we don't see often, they're kind of trans elephants, we see them less than five times a year. These are annual number of sightings per year. So the most elephant we've seen like 45 times a year, 40 times a year. Um, so yeah, it's, it's um, the elephants that we see very rarely. Uh, we kind of hear about them. People always complain elephant came and invariably we have to put up a camera trap and then we see which elephant it is. So these are elephants that kind of come through in the nights, but they don't interact with people much and we see them very rarely, right? So these are the first we are called, what we're calling transient elephants. The second, this is the level of land use modification. Quickly, red is more modified, uh, green is less modified. And even the green is natural vegetation 500 meters from habitation. So it's not a forest far away. It's like a patch of forest or a tea estate that's just 500 meters away from habitation. So here, if you look at elephants that are largely naturalish habitats, uh, that's the next kind. Uh, they kind of come to hills and things like that within the Goodlood landscape. And we see them often, this is the key. And this is again a demonstration of these cheap cameras that are quite amazing, uh, very high zoom. You can literally stand on one hill and uh, photograph an elephant from another hill. Right? So this is an example of the second kind of elephants, the regular visitors, but then they don't come near habitation much. And then there's a third kind in terms of how they respond to people. Now what you expect is the physiological response of fight or flight. Either they kind of attack the people or they run away. Um, and there's a proportion of elephants who do that. Here are two young tuskers in the Torpali area near the edge of uh, Mudumalai. 
And if you look at their body language, they're not that comfortable around people, right? They're clearly kind of running away and uncomfortable around people. Uh, here's another guy. He's in a team plantation. It's a pity I can't share the sound with this, but like there's amazing background noise. They're all people chatting, chatting, and then they decide to shout, and then he starts running, right? So uh, they kind of run away. But the flip side of this, again, in Torpali, is that they may attack people as well, right? There's somebody shouting, and he goes straight at the person. Again, there's a loud trumpet, which you can't hear, unfortunately. Um, so this is the, the kind of third category. And the fourth are the very unusual elephants that uh, I argue are highly habituated. They're used to people, and they don't respond in a significantly negative way. This is Ganeshan. He's moving towards habitation and people and the forest department are trying to move him away, right? Keep him away from houses, push him back into the forest, but he's not having it. He's going straight on, one right under his trunk, but he doesn't bother, keeps going where he wants to go. Uh, this is another elephant, Bharadan, again, uh, in the Torpali area near the edge of Mudumalai. Very close to people, people kind of shouting at him, all of that, but... Uh, not responding to them at all. Right, walking along a national highway there, uh, cars coming by him, all of that, no, no impact. Um, so when you classify these, the key thing we found is that only 6% of the elephants actually uh, significantly uh, have a negative impact on people in terms of they, they are the ones that exhibit this fight or flight. But the elephants that are transient don't interact with people. Elephants that stay away from habitation don't interact with people. That constitutes close to 85% of the elephants. It's only the last few that actually cause trouble. And eight of them are again highly habituated where nothing happens really. They don't attack people much. It's only a few elephants that are causing all the damage. Uh, this was hugely important in that the forest department changed its approach from chasing elephants whenever they see elephants to chasing elephants if it were these young kind of fight or flight elephants that would possibly attack people. For all other elephants, they just put one staff there to start watching and monitoring the elephants and telling local people there are elephants there. Uh, and I think this has had a huge impact. The number of deaths has come down from like 12 a year to two or three a year. Um, so it's very significant. I think both the elephants and the people have kind of better learned to live with each other over the last few years, which is quite amazing, I think. And the key thing is that behavior also changes. It's not a standard thing. This is Ganesh in, uh, in 2013. And this is him in 2017, right? There's a drastic change over the over four years. You can look at him. He's much more habituated and comfortable around people. There's a man telling him, go away, go away. There's nothing there in this house. Uh, and middle of the day, he's casually walking around houses. And the key is that he has a huge fan following. Like, Wherever he goes, there are kind of always people following him around, taking pictures, quite amazed by him, right? Quite like a local celebrity. There's his fan following going behind him. So, the, yeah, these elephants are quite amazing. There are quite a few in this landscape. So, yeah, this is another one of him um, with people. I won't go into this. I think this is a little, a little short of time. But, yeah, again, in O'Valley, he's like that. And, um, I'll argue that there are these kind of elephants in all the landscapes. This is just off Facebook. I keep getting feeds and news feeds of Munar uh, Padayappa, kind of well-known elephant uh, in that landscape in Kerala, who seems to be very similar, highly habituated. He'll be seen around houses and all of that. Uh, that does not do significant damage. Uh, Koyambuto also, Madhukare Maharaj, Raudi Ganga, which Karnataka, uh, Kalur Komben in Kerala. But the key point, I think, in all of this is that we don't know enough about these elephants. Like, Elephants are often captured when there's a huge amount of problem and people get killed. But I argue that very often it's the wrong elephants. Like in Gurlur, what was happening is whenever there's a hue and cry about elephants, the first thing was let's capture Ganeshan. He's the biggest and uh, he probably creates trouble. But actually he wasn't. The oldest kind of males are really wise chaps who don't create trouble. So that wasn't really the problem. So conclusions. Um, I mean, I'm going to go with some simple conclusions here and then maybe talk for five minutes about... Uh, some of the challenges um, and how we kind of conduct interdisciplinary research and some kind of broader questions uh, around this. But very quickly, you definitely need like baseline information. Um, you can't go into a landscape very quickly and try to study one part of the story or the puzzle and then come back and kind of think that we have an idea about what's happening. Like the land use, the distribution of elephants and people, all of these are hugely uh, important. Um, 
it's it's very important to understand this before you go into a landscape. Um, the diversity in the people is usually important. I think both Sahil and Dee have talked about this as well. Uh, the, it's, the culture is a key factor, not just uh, attitudes and things that you can measure. Um, and the diversity in elephants is again, hugely important, right? Um, and finally, all of these tools can be useful, but they are not an end in itself. It's finally how the people in the landscape kind of collectively work together and respond to elephants. Uh, that's particularly important. Um, so that's, that's more or less like a quick kind of screen share, um, screenshot of all that was happening here. Um, Vidya, maybe I'll just go a couple of minutes in kind of talking about, um, yeah, is that okay? Uh, do we have time? Quickly, in a sense, it's a more kind of my personal journey in terms of how I was doing research and the challenges. And I think the reflections in terms of the relevance of a lot of this at broader scales, right? So the first was, um, like this early warning system, like I said, the, the whole uh, concept of working with understanding the diversity with people uh, and the complexity of a landscape is hugely important, right? Um, even this, our early warning system, which worked really well in Valpare and has saved lots of lives, had no impact here and was kind of creating the opposite. Uh, so understanding the distribution of elephants is kind of was key in making us decide what works or not. So it's really important for anyone, I think, to engage with the landscape over a long time or a reasonably long time at least. And like Sahil has done or Dee has done to actually be there, live there for some time. These are kind of key concepts in anthropology. You can't really understand the landscape unless you live there like a local for a while, understand the people. I think this applies to the human wildlife interface as well. If you just quickly swoop in and do a questionnaire survey and go back out, what you've captured may be completely wrong. Like in this landscape, all the battle is around land. And if you quickly go in and ask people, do you have problems with wildlife? They will all start off on, yeah, yeah, it's horrible. Wild animals do this, that, and the other. And you ask them, okay, so what do you do? They'll say, we give us land, give us title for our land. And you ask, well, what's the connection between elephants breaking down your house or killing people and getting title for your land? Then they're kind of stumped. And that's when you open up all these kind of other interaction, other more complex uh, uh, questions around the people wildlife interface. And land is just, land is the key issue. That's human wildlife problems with elephants are not really the key issue. The other kind of bigger challenge is this whole question of interdisciplinarity, right? We've been talking about it a lot in uh, conservation, the whole social science versus natural science. Um, and there's a huge amount of work on trying to be interdisciplinary. But to me, um, we're kind of missing the boat here. What's happening actually is that it's more a question of epistemology and what we believe constitutes legitimate knowledge. So in, uh, in conservation, we largely, it's a kind of, it's a body of work that's come out of biology where the basis of knowledge is positivism or more quantified positivism. It's like you have to be able to measure and uh, study something and kind of do some statistical analysis with that data for it to be relevant, right? Uh, I think we don't really believe that knowledge exists underneath and under, outside of that framework. So for an example, if, if, there's an, if there's an Adivasi person who believes that they can talk to elephants um, and they can actually communicate with elephants and tell them how to behave and that allows them to live more peacefully, that's not really knowledge. That can't be considered knowledge in this framework. Um, so this is, I think this is a key issue. And though all of the journals claim to want interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary work, what they mean is they want social science that is still pos quantified positivism. They're not going to be able to say, I went and I stayed in this village for so long and write a nice paper about people's beautiful beliefs. That's not going to fly in a conservation journal. I've tried it, trust me, and got rejected a couple of times. So um, I think this is a key thing that conservation has to adapt. And I'm going to kind of go out on a wing here and I say, I think we are quite well adapted in India to do it, uh, perhaps more than other places, right? Uh, the whole kind of knowledge in the West has come out of the Bible. That's something that most people miss. Like if you look at the, the theory of knowledge, uh, it all started with hermeneutics, where everything, all knowledge came from the Bible and interpreting that text. Then it went to kind of logic and metaphysics, where you, if you could construct an argument, the Greeks were great at this, like if you could construct an argument and a logical way of thinking about something, that was knowledge. And then went to complex positivism of uh, collecting data and verifiable empirical uh, data. And that kind of evolved into a scientific method. Now, we don't have this baggage of the Bible here in most of the Eastern cultures. So we don't necessarily have to, so science is a reaction to that uh, form of knowledge. Or even the whole narrative around you believe in science in the US, for example, now. Uh, it's like either I believe in kind of creationism and that, or I believe in science. But that dichotomy doesn't exist here and we don't need to fall into that uh, strict dichotomy. 
And I'd say that this is happening to a large extent. There's a very interesting book by Michael Lewis some years ago, um, 2005, I think. It's called Inventing Global Ecology. He follows, say, Sukumar and uh, Ravi Chellam and some of the key people in Indian conservation, Madhav Gradgill. Um, these were all people who were trained in this Western method of understanding nature as this human free space. But when they came to India, they encounter people when they go out to do field work or uh, interact with people. So they kind of brought the human back into uh, the whole narrative ecology by the reality of India. And my hope is that with the next generation of researchers, uh, we can do this more proactively. I mean, I think Michael Lewis doesn't actually say this, but this happened inadvertently. It was not by design. It was not like I think that this generation of people thought about epistemology and a theory of knowledge and intentionally brought the people back in. They were just there. You can't kind of study human uh, conservation landscapes in India without people. All our protected areas have people and there are tons of animals living outside protected areas. So I think, yeah, I, I strongly believe and hope that we can kind of move away from this dichotomy and we're better placed to do it because of our worldview in this country. Uh, the whole question of ontology, right? Um, it's very different from this Western uh, kind of construction of knowledge. And hopefully we can use that and build on it more positively. Um, the next, I think, uh, yeah, key, I don't know, is there time or should we wind up and go move to questions? I want to make one more point about kind of how we study elephants. Uh, maybe quickly, huh? Three yeah. minutes. So, uh, no, no, one minute, one minute. <laughs> one minute, oh, right. So again, like, like we, I think we all kind of recognize that quantified positivism, uh, there's more to studying people than just quantified positivism. It's not an either or. It's not that knowledge exists here or exists there. It's that can you accept different forms of knowledge exist? And I think the same is true when we study animals. Uh, so our own journey when studying elephants, I knew the whole kind of people question I knew. I've grown up, grown up in this landscape and I knew that people were different. It was just a question of collecting data that fitted into that framework of what was knowledge and presenting that in a way that you know, here is knowledge and proof or scientifically, a scientific approach to studying diversity. When I came to elephants, I didn't know what to do. So my approach was let me ask the experts. So I asked some biologist friends of mine, can you kind of help me? I want to kind of really understand these elephants better. And we had a, uh, some really good people, I think, uh, won't go into name now, but came and spent a couple day here in Gurlu. And we went to see elephants and it was chaos, right? Elephants in these landscapes are invariably chaos. Like the forest department were chasing them on one side, local people were all there. Everybody's trying to show us photos of the elephants on their phones. And like the elephants were finally chased up one hill. So we went up the hill quickly. Then somebody called to say, no, no, there are more elephants there. So we all jumped into a Jeep. Half the people went there, half the people went there. We spent the whole day like this, absolutely haphazard. Elephants would be hiding under some trees. We can't really see them. We've come to take photographs and identify individuals and study behavior, all of that. He couldn't do anything. And at the end of the day, he told me, see, these elephants are not proper. You can't study them using any proper tools, right? Uh, you give up, you just do some ad libitum sampling or some old type of thing. Now, ad libitum sampling is essentially the same as ethnography. You spend a lot of time with the elephants and just gather as much information you can in a not structured way. And I think this kind of maps onto lots of debates about animals. Are, how do we consider animals, right? Are animals essentially these uh, kind of, a, yeah, are they just, are they able to kind of think and do things on their own? Like, do they have intentionality in the way they behave? Or are they these Darwinian beings that are just responding to natural stimuli and kind of preconditioned uh, kind of way in which they operate? So I think um, this epistemological approach of how we study um, people, we can also extend to animals to so study animals and kind of think of animals differently. And again, I feel very kind of hopeful that we can do a lot of this in India. Thanks. I think I'll wind up now. Sorry, gone a bit over time as well, I think. You're muted, Vidya. Yeah, Tarsh, thank you. Fascinating talk like the other two and you left us with a lot of questions in our head. Um, so I'd like to thank all three of you for spending so much time and I'd like to thank the viewers who have been sitting and will be sitting for two hours, I think. I really appreciate you all joining us. I hope it was useful for you all. Uh, I'm going to just ask the questions that uh, have come. Yeah. So the first question is for Sahil. Uh, uh, we wonder, are the teeth on Nava Sipa's clothes tiger's teeth? And this is a question from Tansi and Dasil. Did you get that, Sahil? Manish will have to unmute all of us. Um, I did. Sorry, I was sitting yeah. outside, but it was really loud, so I'm going to come back in. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, thank you, Tansy and the self. 
Um, the, the, the teeth, some of the uh, teeth in the necklace that Navasipa wore were actually tiger canines. And they're typically taken from tigers that die in the area. Uh, and uh, the power of the shaman is believed to rest in those teeth. So uh, the shaman is only able to perform and protect the people or speak to the spirits when it's wearing the, uh, the necklace, which is called Amrala. Um, and through that necklace and through the power of the tiger, the shaman becomes powerful and then is able to negotiate with very strong and, and, and powerful spirits. Thank you. Uh, the next question is also for you. Uh, I don't know who it is from. Manisha's typed this down. But uh, is there proof that tigers now that there is proof that tigers are found in community forests? Is there a threat that will be declared a tiger reserve? Well, the um, as far as I'm aware, the plans to declare a tiger reserve um, are uh, limited to the wildlife sanctuary, the Bang Wildlife Sanctuary. Um, but you. You allude to, I think, a larger issue, which I think um, is, is has defined conservation in India, is we, we, you know, we go in these places, we find animals that we we have determined to be endangered, and then without thinking about the history, the culture, or any of the material aspects of the landscape, just because that animal is there, we we declare it protected, and then it becomes a legal entity. That's what we have done. Uh, for decades in this country, and that's what we continue to do. For instance, the Bang Wildlife Sanctuary wasn't declared in consultation with the local people. Actually, most people didn't even know the exact boundaries and still do not know the exact boundaries of where the Bang Wildlife Sanctuary is. Um, Arunachal works slightly differently from the rest of the country in terms of its land ownership and tenure regime, which, um, you know, which, what is that? It recognizes de facto not de jure, not by law, but de facto ownership of uh, land and forest by communities outside of the protected areas. Um, so I don't know exactly whether you can just simply declare these areas tiger reserves, but there are attempts to change that law. Um, and I feel like if we're heading in this direction in which we're make, breaking the landscape into two kind of things, there will be the, you know, the hydropower projects or industries and reserves. I think Arunachal will end up becoming similar to the rest of the country. The next two questions are also for Sahil. The first one's from Athira Perencheri. Uh, I'd like to know more about the changes in tiger density in community forests versus others in Dibang Valley that you found. And could you tell us more about this and why this could be happening? Um, so the, um, I think the reasons for the, the difference in densities are partly ecological and in a small part um, also uh, people-based. And I couldn't tell you what percentage is, is attributable to which. The ecological reasons are that um, the, a lot of the community forests um, are actually um, also at lower elevations. Uh, and these are the places where there is a resident supply of uh, prey species. Um, whereas a large part of the protected area is above 600 so like I said, 65% of the protected area is above 3,500 meters, where uh, except one prey animal, which is the musk deer, no other animal is re resident in winter. So the tigers are responding to where more natural prey are. But, it, but also, uh, there are no mithun inside the protected area. All mithun are in the community forest. And what I've seen with multiple years of, of work there is that seasonally, uh, tigers prey on mithun. Um, and even females with adult cubs will sometimes bring their cubs closer to settlements to, to, to prey on mithun. So I think that might be contributing to that too. But I couldn't tell you which is, the, is, is more important. But I think it's a combination of these two. Uh, the next question to Sahil. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the name here on my computer. But it says, fascinating work. How do the young Mishnis see the Iduena and other taboos? With education and modernization, how are these values changing among the youngsters, or are they not? Um, I I would actually prefer that my Idu collaborator, who is a young Idu, actually answers this, this question. So if you hold on for just a second, I'm going to invite her in um, and ask her to speak. Um, Ajali, are you there? Can you talk? Um, Trying to unmute. Hello. Hi, Achille. Um, so Hi. The question, question tha, wo, uh, 
विद्या आई एम गोइंग रिपीट द क्वेश्चन समझ आया क्वेश्चन अच्छा या रिपीट करूं हां हां नहीं समझ आया हां जी जी पीछे जवाब अ तो सवाल ये था कि मतलब मैटेरियलिस्टिक जैसे जैसे लोग मैटेरियलिस्टिक होते जा रहे हैं उस तरह कल्चर उतना उस वे में डाइल्यूट हो जाएगा सो आई डोंट थिंक दैट इट विल डाइल्यूट सो इजीली बिकॉज आई एम आल्सो बिलोंग गेम फ्रॉम द यंग जनरेशन एंड आई स्टिल आई आई स्ट्रिक्टली फॉलो टेबू सिस्टम एंड मेरे उम्र के बहुत सारे लोग हैं जो अभी अभी भी टेबल सिस्टम को बहुत ही ज्यादा स्ट्रिक्टली फॉलो करते हैं और वो इसलिए नहीं है कि लोगों को दिखाने के लिए या लोगों को भाने के लिए वी फॉलो द टेबल सिस्टम बिकॉज इट इज बीन इंजेक्टेड आई मीन ऑन आज बेटली बाय आवर पेरेंट्स और हम लोग इसी ही एनवायरमेंट में पले बड़े हैं तो मुझे नहीं लगता कि ये बहुत जल्दी खत्म होगा बहुत सारे चीजों से जुड़ा हुआ है और फिर दूसरे एंगल से हम देखते हैं तो नाउ वी बिकमिंग अवेयर ऑफ लाइक द इम्पोर्टेंस ऑफ नेचर और तो इसको बचा के रखना है भी दिस इज आल्सो आवर रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी तो दोनों ही दोनों ही एंगल से अगर हम देखते हैं तो uh, इस चीज को हम इतना जल्दी मतलब खत्म होने तो नहीं देंगे एक तो हमारे अंदर में डर पहले से ही है और दूसरा ये भी कि मतलब हम इसके इम्पोर्टेंस को और अच्छी तरह से समझ भी रहे हैं आई होप आई थैंक यू अचली आई जस्ट वॉन्ट आई एड टू क्विक थिंग्स टू दैट सो एक्चुअली देर इज अपर दैट कम आउट इन कपल ऑफ it's some days it's been in post production for months now which is co-authored by Achille and I and that talks about what taboos mean for the idu people and so i've 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 told you what how they are performed how they're observed and what they look like on the surface but what they going two levels deeper what they actually signify is what that paper discusses um what i argue in that paper is that taboos are not an isolated component of the idu culture it's not something you do one day and then you do the next day they because they are present in every activity that you do taboos orient the life orient the world for you they sort of become the glasses through which you see the world and so these taboos create identity it may, defines who you are in many instances it's through the observance of these taboos every day that you identify as idu it they make you who you are so i think while taboos are changing um and one of the reasons why taboos are changing also is the spread of christianity in that area but that's a thing for a topic for discussion another time while they are changing there are some identity defining taboos that are still pretty dug in okay uh yeah thanks sahil can you hear me yeah yeah so uh one minute i'm trying to figure out yeah the next question is to the is uh, what are the perspectives of locals when they have negative interactions with leopard um manish you'll have to unmute the please I think uh I think the perspectives that I was trying to explain earlier didn't uh, necessarily refer only to positive interactions so even the negative interactions uh quote on quote negative interactions that uh, people would have with uh with the leopards for example it was livestock loss or if there is human injury or anything like that the same stories and the same uh way of looking at the animal would uh would define that as well so for example if they thought of it as mysterious or uh or even as frustrating or uh loss inducing and hurtful or all of those things uh it was it was the idea that at each instance it would differ from uh like at each situation it would be different right so it wasn't 
that leopards are always like this and when there's a negative interaction they would get angry at it but at each situation it would be different so all the perspectives that i was talking about earlier applies for negative interactions as well yeah thank you dee and also meenal tatpati say uh, says thanks dee we found the same narratives among translocation of leopards in southwest rajasthan among shepherds that's just a comment yeah and uh, divya deshwal asks sahil uh, like any other society idu mishmi society is also facing threat of dilution of culture their taboo system i guess this has been answered by actually right yeah, materialism yeah, yeah. so i will yeah. yeah so um uh, then some anonymous person <laughs> that's one how many cameras were deployed in pa and in community reserve outside pa how did you arrive on 4.5 times higher density of tigers outside pa sahil so i placed in total uh, 283 Three camera traps or camera locations across the landscapes, um, and there were um, there there was an equal number of cameras that were placed within and outside the the wildlife sanctuary in the community forest. How I derived the the density estimates, I used the commonly available spatially explicit capture recapture uh, framework SCCR, um, and um, which. you know gives you density estimates as a function of uh, habitat variables and the capture rates of speed of individual tigers in the landscape um thanks uh, sahil so there are a lot of questions so people who are attending the webinar please feel free to leave there are like 35 questions so uh, arvin has asked uh thanks for the informative webinar my question is for tarsh if there are tribes that have a high tolerance high interaction with elephants and yet low conflict in their settlements has there been an effort to emulate the same practices slash mindset in other regions would that really work also how is the interest of of the locals to know and identify different individuals of elephants present in the region tarsh did you get that yeah. yeah i did um so first um, yeah in terms of kind of exporting this uh ontology if you will from one community to another is something that has to happen on its own i don't think a conservation intervention or a conservation education program can change people's fundamental beliefs about what an animal is right it is very hard to do but that said it's reasonably it's happening already and it's uh, it's not again a dichotomy of um, these tribes believe this that's perfect and these other people believe that that's horrible it's again there's a range and the range officers and other local communities uh, for example her telling me that listen though that village is so good let's uh, ask them to come and do pujas in all the places right so it's exactly this let's just export this idea of we can live well with animals with elephants we'll do the same things everywhere but it doesn't work like that the katnaikins can't do the same ritual in other villages and tell elephants you don't go to that village also right it's not a simple telling it's like a whole relationship with elephants that is negotiated so um yeah there's no there's no easy answer to this on the one hand these animistic beliefs will permeate to other uh, cultures maybe or uh, other cultures will learn to live better with animals inevitably even if it's not through the same animistic belief system um so it will happen but you can't just export it you can't say you these people believe this all of you all should believe the same you can't do it and you can't design a conservation program to very easily do that uh, in terms of individuals yeah i think everybody uh, what we found is even before we went into the landscape local people initially know knew more than us about the elephants they would tell us like that whole baradan for example the very famous elephant in torpalli the first time i went there 2013 we went there in the night we heard that this elephant was coming every day and we were sitting in our jeep waiting for an elephant to come and suddenly this huge elephant comes walking through the cars in like the parking lot there and we got on and ran and local people laughing at us and saying ha ha you researchers you are running away from elephants you don't know this is a very peaceful guy he won't do anything you can sit and watch and they are watching from 5 feet away so i think everybody knows certain individuals and kind of attributes certain values and uh, beliefs to them that is useful but they don't know all the elephants right and so to be more systematic about it the few individuals they knew a lot they knew a lot about uh, others they didn't so it was more kind of systematizing this study of individual elephants to extend it to all the elephants mm. and i argue that that worked really well it's uh, it's made a huge difference for the local staff the overall level of knowledge has increased for everybody and for local people like these images of individual elephants circulate on whatsapp groups and things like that anyone sends a photo and says which elephant you send them the um, 
profile of that elephant and says this is the one you don't need to worry just be a little careful uh, he's not likely to do anything there are particular elephants that are dangerous as well like there's one herd that's very famous for breaking houses and if it's like broken they've broken 15 houses also in the last 3 years so for those also the other way also works you give people information about particular behaviors uh, thanks yeah thanks tarsha there's a question by mahi mankeshwar which is for sahil was there a specific belief that underlying the separation between hunting and then not being allowed to partake in social activities um uh, thank you mahi i i'll very quickly try to address this and then i will i will direct you to the paper that's about to come out in a couple of uh uh days hopefully a shameless plug um the yes i um you know it's as an as an as an anthropologist it's uh, we're we're trying to understand what underlies people's behavior um and what i believe uh that this separation is actually central to um to maintaining people distinctly from animals so the reason you know um it's pretty I, I, again you know if i if i struggle to answer this question is because i struggle sometimes to understand it uh so my my fluency in responding to this re represents my fluency in understanding some of these deeper issues of that a lot of the people who live these the, these cultures don't quite reason sometimes um so i think the the whole idea in the idu uh, culture rests on being able to maintain the separation between what is natural and wild and what is human and 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 hence non wild and humans engage in these social activities and by actively choosing not to put wild what is wild in these social activities you maintain who you are as people because both people and animals come from the same ancestor so the moment you stop performing these rituals and these activities you risk be going back to who you were which was just an animal form um and i this is what i understood was the motivation behind these taboos um but i am very happy to be questioned and challenged in uh, in my understanding of this uh from Sta uh, stan tekekaira there is a quest uh, a question to sahil uh, to sahil specifically but also all three speakers great stories of human relationships with animals especially among indigenous people in all the rules governing human interaction with animals i wonder if any of you would like to comment that these rules emerge from a tribal view that is they are as a part of nature and not owners so would anybody want to respond to that or since tarsh uh, tarsh has the same last name as stan perhaps you want to go first <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll add to it. <laughs> I mean, that, that's a little unfair. That's actually my dad there, and I think I'll leave it to you, Sai. We've had lots of discussions on all of this. <laughs> you can probably talk about this over dinner. Yeah, or over beer, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, whatever is the yeah. medium. Yeah, you would choose. Um, so the Mr. Stan, um, I'll I'll very quickly uh, talk about, it, and then I'll give uh, it over to Dee if she wants to add some stuff. Um, I. I think that there is no one uh one world view or one category called the tribal. Um it's a diverse world uh with lots of peoples and different ways of relating to the environment and to one another. Um and typically it, the tribal people who practice or believe anim in animism uh do believe that animals have their own ways of living. um and they are typically owned by non-human spirits um but there are other uh, you know other communities that would be classified as tribal who practice hinduism or are now christian and they would look at it differently uh and in the in the communities that do believe in animism still i feel like some of this can be extrapolated some of this does apply to that that animals are believed to not be human property um uh, but um not to all tribals across the country or the world Deed, thank you i had something saldi she will have to be unmuted yeah i've just unmuted her hi yeah thanks uh yeah i would just add to that to say uh actually what tash was saying earlier about how uh actually modernity in uh in the way that it is homogenized the way we thought has put one narrative of how we relate to animals but uh i think 
as you said, there's no one tribal view, but there's lots of different ways of viewing probably, which we haven't really explored because we haven't tried to study that very much. It's very recent that we've tried to start studying that. So maybe if we look into it in different cultures, we might find many different ways of relating to animals. Yeah, thanks. The, um, there's another anonymous attendee who asks, how can one be part of a conservation project with tribal communities? Um, I, uh, should I go first? Yeah, go for it. Okay, okay. Um, I mean, um, I think that's, again, a very broad question. I, I really do appreciate the, the intention and the sentiment, but I'm perhaps not able to answer that question crisply on, on this call. What I would say is that I think what the, all three of us have tried to uh, present here are ways of telling stories from different perspectives. We typically hear about conservation and wild animals uh, the, uh, only from con biology trained conservationists. And we've tried to tell stories from all these different perspectives. I think in your own way, I, I do not know what your background is, Mr. Anonymous Dendi, uh, but in your own way, perhaps we can begin uh, with uh, mainstreaming some of these stories that have long been, been sidelined and put on the margins of the society. And if enough of us believe and accept that there are multiple ways of looking at wildlife, of living with them or not living with them, uh, and being, being you know, uh, accepting of, of these dif different views, uh, then perhaps we can start to think about how to make partnerships and contribute more directly. Sorry, that's a, a little wishy-washy. Yeah. Um, anybody else or shall I? Go to the next question. We have now 42 questions. I think we'll have to stop soon. Um, okay, so the next one. Wrong. Yeah. Like you mentioned, Dibang Valley is a remote area and needs development. This is from Anonymous again. So in the near future, there will be influx of people from outside. So the very Elvin legacy dilemma remains that the tribals are very special people and must be kept separate from the rest of Indian society in order to conserve and preserve their ethnic identity. So I'd like to ask how tribal land should be developed is the question. Um, thank you for that question. It's, um, I, I mean, I think it's a very, very important and sort of the existential question, the answer to which I will not be able to do justice to in the time that we have. Um, and I encourage you to write to me separately and we can have a longer discussion about it. Uh, but I really, I mean, I think it's, um, uh, you know, it touches on different spheres of academic debate uh, in which we, you know, this, this title indigenous or tribal is sort of becoming a weight uh, up uh, or a title uh, and then the indigenous people are now required to stand up to it and to perform and to show that they actually can conserve to be called indigenous. Um, and again, that since you are indigenous and you're able to protect conservation then you must not. You must be kept away from the perils uh, of modernity. I, I think that I think there is a lot of merit in these debates, but I think the dichotomy is not as strong. Um, I think that I mean, but the Idu people by no means are uh, the primitives. You know, these ecologically noble savages living on trees and eating fruit and grass. Uh, you know, they're modern people. They go to school. They they engage in wage labor. Their livelihoods that are non-forest dependent. Yet some of these systems are able to grow. Um, and I also think that this requires us challenging what development is. I mean, the notions of development that we have again come from uh, this idea of you know um, the modern man, which are copied from the West. And development in India has followed the same model of de of development that the World Bank. Uh, promotes and that has been promoted in all Western societies. Um, and so, I, I mean, I, I, I really think that it's, it's a longer discussion, but it's a very good discussion to be had. And we may not arrive at, at very simple answers. Um, uh, but what I would end with is that Varir Elwin had foresight. And at that time, you know, as, as an anthropologist uh, of the 60s, his idea was to protect the customary ways of the tribal people by putting in or allowing these constitutional mandates. I think they've, um, you know, this sort of ties in with the debate on indigenous sovereignty and, and, uh, and the, the ability for indigenous people to make decisions about their land. So I do, there's something to be said about that. Sorry, I'm 
mumbled for on for a while. Maybe Tarsh and Dee can answer. Um. Yeah, Dee, do you want to say anything? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that, uh, especially in India and in the landscape that I was working with, because it's not exactly what you would call a tribal community. They're, they're Hindu beliefs, right? And culturally, perhaps, we don't know what the history of that, I don't know what the history of that space is, but you can see that culturally, there are ways, other ways of relating to animals. And I think it's indicative that it's not a matter of you preserve it by keeping everything exactly as it has been for years and that is the way to conserve these ways of thinking but seeing how it interacts with the world that we're in right now as well uh yeah yeah i just tell me that i'm trying to figure out the next question it's a maze of questions and it's hard to navigate and try to decide that yeah, it's not been on answered my already. Phone especially. There's this question from Divya Jyoti Ganguly for Sahil. So the Edus follow this these range of restrictions post returning from a hunt. However, are there any specific restrictions that are followed during a hunt? For example, I've heard of restrictions of hunting infants and pregnant females being a part of the ancestry of certain other tribes. Thank you, Divya Jyoti. Um, there are. Uh, it depends on the kind of hunt you go to. So if you're going on hunts in the higher mountains, then there is a whole long list of code of conduct and restrictions that you follow, which includes, um, you know, not um, not talking badly about people. Um, it was actually when they're in the forest, you can't even use the words for animals that you would wor use when you're in the village. So you have to use avoidance words. Uh, to give you an example, uh, the word for tiger is Amra, uh, but when the, they are in the forest, you don't use the word Amra, you call it Angochi, which means uh, the one who, who walks on the ridge lines. And it is because it is believed that when you're in the forest, if you say this, the tigers can hear you and they can understand that they're being called. Um, and then, you know, you like, like I said, you can't bring uh, dirty, any dirty thoughts, no sexual thoughts in your mind when you're in the forest. You don't talk very loudly. You don't even pick firewood that, if burnt, uh, would crack and produce loud noises. So it's just a you, you are in the forest and you try to maintain calm both inside your body and outside in the environment. I actually didn't follow these rules once. And the result was that picture that you saw with my tent covered in snow. Uh, we hiked up this high mountain and I saw this lake, which seemed like the beach in Bahamas. And I started yelling with my field assistant. And two hours later, there were crowds, clouds that came in from nowhere, and we were we were snowed in. So the the response from the spirits is immediate and very clear to the rules that have been created. Um, and uh, other restrictions as to um, hunting infants and pregnant females. Um, so it depends on the hunting method. If the hunting is done by guns, then uh, which are legally owned in most north most of northeast India. Uh, then people can have people have a choice. If you're able to see, then you would. I don't see that most people actually make that active choice. Uh, but I do know that when people are out hunting for musk deer, and they're only after males because they're after the musk uh, pods, then they do select for males. And in the past, even in in the traps they would lay, if there were females that were or young that were caught, they would let them free. Yeah, thanks, Sahil. Uh, here's an interesting question from Dasim, who is six years old, to Tarsh. Uh, which elephant in your area is best at breaking fences? Tarsh is muted. Uh, thanks, Dasim. That's a nice question. Um, so there was one particular male, a young guy who was very adventurous and he used to come out of the forest a lot and want to see lots of people. Um, and he, he was the most uh, intrigued by, I think, what's happening in human areas. So he's the one who first started experimenting. Uh, I can send you lots of videos of him kind of trying to negotiate a fence. And finally he found his head tusks don't conduct electricity and he started carefully breaking the wires. That's the video I showed. So he's the best. But interestingly, he other elephants tried to copy him, and that didn't work so well because um, 
there was a younger elephant older elephant actually who had shorter tusks and when he would do that the wires would snap into his face and he got a bad shock and there was another big elephant that didn't have tusks and he also tried to break the fence but he also got a bad shock so yeah he's the best and that's why we call him ali baba legendary figure who can open any door uh, but there are lots of other <laughs> elephants who are also trying thanks uh there's a question from tatsy troy are there distinct myths slash songs um, around the elephants and people for example among cartoon icons and do you feel there's an ancient mythical connection between the indigenous tribes and your area of study as with the indus and the tigers sarsh uh thanks tansi um this is a complex one i have to say i mean unlike sahil i haven't done a very rigorous ethnography in that i lived with one village for a very long time i kind of live in this landscape so i i am i am one of the kind of uh, observers in this landscape so i don't have that much of an intrinsic uh, understanding of all the myths that each village has or each tribe has with animals um but i think definitely they all have a very strong bond with elephants um, which is it's a, it's a very nuanced and complicated thing they believe that some elephants are good and some elephants are bad so some elephants you can shout out and chase away so uh, some elephants you shouldn't they're very nice elephants you should not do anything um so it's a, it's an understanding of elephants like people elephants are other than human persons and like all of humans are different from each other some people you get along with some people you don't get along with uh, the same belief system exists for elephants and this is definitely a very ancient uh, kind of connection uh, undoubtedly um and again the indigenous is complicated because i would say animistic beliefs extend not only to the hunter gatherers even the mulukurumbas say who are a settled agriculturalist tribe have lots of animistic beliefs but their relationship with elephants is slightly different they have a lot of stuff on tigers they used to hunt tigers um, they have a huge history around tigers but i won't go into that now and that wasn't the key part of my study it was all kind of happened on the side um so yeah there, i think there is a, a strong ancient link with animals um but it's very complex it's not always this beautiful rosy picture that they don't ever destroy any animals or they don't ever chase animals or they're not always good to animals right if a leopard comes and kind of hunts your um like a leopard used to leopard while i was working for an elephants a leopard came every day and kept eating one goat of this man and after not every every other day but after two three weeks he lost all his goats and what he did after that was that he put a trap with nylon rope so he doesn't hurt the elephant any uh, the leopard and he caught the leopard in a nylon trap and beat it with a stick and shouted at it and said don't take my goats and let it go right <laughs> so he didn't want to kill it because it's not it's not killed a human being right it's only killed its goats and it needs to eat it will kill goats so he some violence which many conservationists will get upset by how dare he capture capture a leopard and hit it but for him like it's uh, done something wrong and i have to tell it that it can't do that again and i explain to it that it shouldn't do that and i made it out some punishment and that's now okay um so it's a very complex relationship uh, thanks again i'm going off on a yeah tangent and atarsha uh, atira has another question for you she says you mentioned about anthropomorphizing elephants how useful do you think this is in your landscape as a tool for conservation did it increase mm. tolerance to those specific elephants for instance and in brackets such as in the malus or chetis who show lower tolerance to elephants as per your data um yeah i mean this was in a sense a starting point it wasn't uh, as i as a person living here i kind of knew that some elephants are different from each other and if we could kind of help identify that difference it would be very useful because it's not all the elephants that do the damage so in a sense anthropomorphic we we didn't think like let's uh, do this as a concept or let's do, find out about elephants and then see if it helps conservation we kind of thought this is going to help conservation let's do it and the academic kind of output of studying the elephants was almost a bright product so I don't know if we can study this formally and document it and say has it increased tolerance, uh, but primarily, I mean, my my role in this landscape isn't exclusively as a researcher, right? I'm a conservationist who I'm and a resident of this landscape who I want everyone here to live more peacefully with elephants. So I don't necessarily want to fit everything into the scientific framework of does it work, but for me, the proof of the pudding kind of lies in the eating and the number of people getting killed, which is in a sense for me the final uh, uh, the bottom line. and the number of negative interactions in terms of how often people are chasing and how violent they are towards elephants that has all changed drastically in the last few years primarily because the forest department first changed their approach of how they deal with elephants and that kind of permeated the entire landscape so everyone has kind of learned that don't necessarily chase all elephants not all all elephants are bad um, forest department will come and monitor and basically what happens is now wherever elephants go there are forest department staff already there with the elephants kind of almost guiding them along like their local guides for taking them around the human landscape 
So invariably when an elephant kind of moves near a house, there are already forest department staff there telling people careful elephants are coming, be careful. So um, this identifying individuals, yeah, it's gone a long way. I, I have not measured if it's particularly changed some communities, but it's gone a long way in kind of improving the relationship between people and elephants altogether in the landscape. Thanks. Yeah, Tarsh Anandu. So we will just uh, have another two questions or three questions uh, because we have really uh, just our time. So Anandu asks if you do you see any change in the FD mindset to move away from spending huge money on trenches or fences. Mm. Uh, this is a complex one. Um, so here they've kind of I think given up on fences, except in Torpoli, they still believe that that's a very kind of it's. Elephants coming out of the park into human habitation, lots of potential danger there, and they're trying to build a fence there to keep that out. But overall, so I would say that uh, forest department in, in some landscapes, definitely they believe that uh, fences and trenches don't, don't work. But everywhere, I'm not sure if this is the right way forward. Like a colleague uh, filed something in Supreme Court about forest department uh, kind of building these spiked barriers to keep elephants out in Karnataka. The thing is, the context of Karnataka there in those rural landscapes is that it's a very hard edge, right? If elephants come out, there's not a single tree and there's acres and acres and acres of very poor people planting ragi. If elephants are going to go and destroy that ragi, it's not something that's sustainable for conservation. It's not good for the elephants. It's not like they're moving from there to somewhere, right? So just coming out of the park, destroying local people's crops and going back. So in those contexts, I don't, I think maybe a hard boundary is inevitable in some places. Um, and I'm not, I mean, I don't see it as a huge problem. Um, that if they build things there. The key is that elephants will break down the fences, they'll breach the trenches. So it's a relationship that people are always trying to evolve on one side, elephants are trying to evolve on the other side. And that relationship has to always be there. You can't believe that you're going to create a, such a hard boundary that um, is going to keep elephants completely in. But on this whole fences thing, the Kosur Forest Department, if you just search for it, Deepak Bilgi was the DFO then, he's a conservator now. They've done some really interesting work in trying to make uh, fences that can't be breached by elephants and they have really amazing camera trap footage. Somebody's cat is uh, also yeah, joining Yeah, he's my cat. <laughs> <laughs> he's so noisy, no. God. <laughs> yeah, but basically uh, they have amazing footage of how elephants are interacting with like a wire rope fence they made. They try everything, how to push it, go over it, go under it, all of that. Uh, there are also these railway fences um, that are causing kind of elephant death and they're getting around them, they're kind of getting killed which is really sad. So, um, yeah, so I don't, basically it's a very complex, I don't have a simple answer. The FD mindset has changed, but it's not the case that we should completely abandon fences and let elephants go everywhere. Um, that may not be best for the elephants either or for the people to have a free reign on uh, local people's crops, right? Uh, so it works for this landscape, it may not work for others. Thanks. Thanks, Tarsh. I think we will have to wind up there. A lot of questions, but I think we are now two hours into our stuff and we all have things to do. And, you know, so I think I'll wind it up now and uh, maybe we can respond. I'll send you all the questions. You all can respond back to the people, you know, if you all have the response for it. So, um, Thank you very much. I would really like to thank the attendees. Uh, and I would really like to also thank Tarsh, Sahil and Dee for joining in. And it was a fascinating session. I think it, uh, if you ask me, you know, this is one thing I wanted to tell that the, you know, no longer are studies of these kind restricted to biologists and ecologists. We need people from many other disciplines to understand the human dimension of this. And India is the best place you can find to study human wildlife relationships. And I hope more and more youngsters will take up and increase our understanding of these shared spaces. So thank you very much. Do you all want to say anything? That's it. Thanks everyone. Thanks yeah. India for organizing this. Yeah. Especially uh, thank you Manish and Arvind yeah, for helping us along. Thanks guys. <laughs>